So be courteous, <laughs> that's what this says, to turn off your cell phones and pagers while the meeting is in session. Turn, oh, I said that tw there's twice. Um, members of the public shall have the opportunity to address the city council concerning any item listed on the agenda during consideration of that item. When the mayor opens the public comments session, no other items may be discussed at this special meeting. The public may email their comments to the city council at any time, uh, at any time to city council at sonomacity.org. And I would like to ask Alex Car Garberg to step forward to help us with the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone would please stand. I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Alex. Roll call, please. Councilmember Cook? Here. Councilmember Henley? Here. Vice Mayor Harrington? Here. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Mayor Agramati? Here. Thank you. And I don't believe there there is was no closed session, so there's nothing Correct. to report out. But I would like at this point at the approval of agenda to turn this over to our city manager, Kathy Capriola. All right. Mayor Agramonte, council, members of the public. Um, I want to just clarify uh, some, some changes that we had yesterday and apologize on, on behalf of the community and council. So uh, as folks know, we've, this is a regular meeting that we had scheduled for today. And as part of a regular meeting, um, the Brown Act requires us to post the agenda in the bulletin board in front of City Hall and to post the agenda on our website. Um, our city clerk was at a conference in San Jose, and so we were posting the agenda virtually. I was in City Hall, we got it posted on the internet, and I forgot to post it in the bulletin board. So with that, it, if we had not rescheduled and done this meeting, put out a special notice um, yesterday, it would have meant that this was not a legal meeting. And there are important items that have to be done on this agenda, and so we made the correction. But I want to apologize to the community and council for my error, and also, um, just thank everyone for putting up with some confusion and but we've got it's an important t technicality and it's now right so we can move forward what that does mean for this meeting though is it's not a regular meeting so it's a special meeting and the brown act says that there is no public comment no general public comment at a special meeting there will be spe there will be public comment on each individual item that's on the agenda and the other I the other change is that um, we did have the second reading for the cannabis personal cult cultivation ordinance on and you have to have a regular meeting in order to pass an ordinance so there I know there were a number of members of the public who were here so what we're going to do is we're going to pull that second reading of the ordinance off the consent calendar it will go on regular calendar which will allow public comment and council can have a conversation um, and see if they if their um, perspectives and votes are staying the same or if anyone has changed their mind and if the council, if the votes are the same, because it was a three-two vote, um, to um, based on the current ordinance, um, then that ordinance uh, will come forward at Monday's <laughs> meeting on June fourth for formal road of ratification. So again, my apologies for any confusion. I think the one main thing is that there is nothing here tonight that stops the council from having any conversation that they want to have that wasn't already on the regular calendar. So um, with that, I will turn it back to the mayor and ask you to formally approve the agenda with moving um, the item 4.5 off of the consent calendar. All right. So we are at that point. Oh, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I would like to make a motion to move item 4.5 to the regular calendar and otherwise approve the agenda. I'll second that. Roll call, please. Councilmember Cook? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Mayor Agramonte? Aye. Thank you. So at this I won't be able to So I just uh, we are not taking comments on the general 
And so at this point, I'd like to know if we have any meeting dedications. I'd like to dedicate this meeting to Mark Maffioli, a Sonoma resident who died in a tragic accident involving an ATV. Um, and the reason I want to dedicate the meeting is um, when I was running for election, I was house calling a number of people and I stopped in and met him and we talked probably for half an hour and he um, was a person who told me that the morning show was televised on KSBY. I was not aware of that prior to that time but regularly watched city council meetings and he was a great guy um, and a uh, Sonoma born person and from a Sonoma family and just really nice and took the time to um, talk with me um, and really cared about what was happening in the city so I'm sad for his family and the loss to our community thank you thank you vice mayor um, Harrington so at this point we're moving on to 3.1 Presentation, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Rebecca, I'm sorry. Trying to steal the show. This will be a presentation of the Cultural and Fine Arts Commission 2018 Student Creative Artist Award. And our chairperson, Kate Schitz, will be doing the presentation. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of the council, and city staff, as chair of your Cultural and Fine Arts Commission, it's once again my great pleasure to present to you the winner of the Student Creative Arts Award. This program was begun in 1988 as the Steve Silver Foundation Award. Since 2002, it has been an award made and funded by the city of Sonoma. During these past 30 years, aspiring writers, actors, poets, musicians, dancers, remember last year, Costume designers and painters have been honored. This year, our awardee is both an actor and a filmmaker, Alexandra Garber. Alex has already made an auspicious start to her future career, having been chosen last year for the prestigious Oregon Shakespeare Festival Junior Seminar, where she experienced the real world of the theater among professionals at one of the finest resident theater companies in the United States. Her first film, Off the Grid, was presented at the 2017 Sonoma International Film Festival where it won a monetary award for excellence in media. She repeated that honor in 2018 with her second film, Anita Neri Floating. This fall, Alex will continue her education in film and theater at UC Davis in the theater and dance as well as the cinema and digital media departments. It's with great pleasure and on behalf of the entire commission that I present to you the soon to be graduate of Sonoma Valley High School, Ms. Alexandra Garber. Alex. Um, I just wanted to thank the commission. Um, art's a huge part of my life. I've been told a lot of times to have a backup in college um, to have something else to um, have in case it doesn't work out, um, not so lucrative in some circumstances. But this gives me the confidence to pursue my art. I truly love filmmaking. I love acting. Um, and I want to thank you all for this great honor. Thank you. Mm. So just doing the Pledge of Allegiance for, for you for us was like, what? It's not a big deal, right? You can get that one. So I'd like to present this to you, City of Sonoma Cultural and Fine Arts Commission 2018 Student Creative Arts Award is hereby granted to Alexandra Garber for Outstanding Talent, presented this 30th day of May 2018. Kate Schertz, CFAC Chair. Thank you so much. And we'd like to take a picture with you. Oh, I'm here. We have some members of the commission also that are here in the audience. If they would come join the council.
One picture. Oh, one picture. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. to our um, consent calendar, our city clerk, Rebecca Barr. All items listed on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be acted upon by a single motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless members of the council, staff, or public request specific items to be removed for separate action. At this time, the council may decide to change the order of the agenda. Please note item 4.5 has been pulled from the consent calendar for separate discussion, but will not be acted upon at this meeting other than that discussion. Thank you so much. So at this point, um, I think we have calendar. Um, I think I'm looking for any any yeah any any um, discussion or anything. Are anyone question? Everyone okay? Yeah. I would, Bill Jasper, 82nd Street East. I would like to remove items 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4 from the consent calendar. I apologize. I should have opened the public session, and I apologize. That but I heard you. I heard you. Thank you. And city manager, where do we go from here? So at this point, the item is pulled from consent, all three items, and so we will take this up next on the agenda because there is... Um, at this point, nothing left on the consent calendar for the council to approve. So um, I will turn to the planning director, David Goodison, just to do a, just a, sorry. Yes, Council Member Hunley. Uh, a point of order. So item 4.1, even though it doesn't actually mean anything, it's on there. Can we just leave it hanging? Or do we have question. to do something with it? I think you can adopt it after uh, we uh, deal with 4.2, 3, and 4. Okay. So are we technically removing that also? Sticking into that? Um, no, it's, it'll remain on the consent calendar. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. So uh, these items are all relate to projects uh, that have been subject to an appeal process. Uh, those being properties known as 149 4th Street East, Brazil Street Lot 227, and Brazil Street Lot 228. Each of the projects calls for the development of a single family residence and related improvements on separate but adjoining parcels at Brazil Street and 4th Street East. All of these properties have a zoning designation of Hillside Residential. After the completion of environmental review, the applications were reviewed and approved by the Planning Commission at meetings that occurred on August 10th and September 14th of 2017. Those, decision, those decisions were subsequently appealed and the three appeals were reviewed by the City Council at meetings held on March 1st, 2018 and April 9th, 2018. Because the three appeals raised issues common uh, to each of the three projects, the appeal review was structured such that the public hearings were open simultaneously so that the applicants, the appellants, and the public would have the opportunity to speak to each item while allowing the council to discuss and provide direction on shared issues as well as matters specific to the individual applications. Following the conclusion of the public hearings, the council directed staff to prepare resolutions upholding the appeals and denying the approval of the three projects. That direction was given through separate votes on the three applications, each approved through the two, which brings us to tonight. Uh, in accordance with that direction, we have prepared uh, resolutions which we believe are in accordance with the council direction. And I would just also like to take this opportunity to add that the city attorney is uh, suggesting a revision to each of the three resolutions, so if you wouldn't mind, um, Reviewing that, thank you. Sure, uh, just it's a, a belts and suspenders uh, a, a, a suggestion, but at the end of each of these resolutions, there is a provision indicating that there's a certain 
code section that governs any challenge brought against uh, each of these measures, I'd like to add an additional code section, and that would be California Government Con Code Section 65009. So if, we, if you would, as part of your motion, if you do move to approve each of these, add that additional code section to the last um, section of, the, uh, of each of the resolutions under the heading Judicial Review. Thank you. How would you like me to proceed then? So I think at this point, uh, we would we are treating this as any other regular item. If there's any questions to the council, we would take any questions to the council. Otherwise, we would go to public comment and then come back to council for council discussion and direction. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, just another or point of order. Uh, so we're, right now, we are starting with 4.2149. Are we doing them all together? I'd recommend that you do them all together. All together. Yes. Package deal. Is there anything that our city attorney needs to do before we go to the out to the public? No, but as um, I m just mentioned, I think it'd be uh, prudent to call them all at the same time: 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4. All right, thank you so much. At this point, I'm going to call for a public s the uh, us to open up public session on 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4. Anyone who would like to step to the podium to speak from the public? <coughs> Yes, Bill Jasper, 82nd Street East. Uh, three items. Number one, I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of the letter that was sent regarding the Brown Act violation <coughs> and the other letter sent from our attorney regarding uh, uh, legal process. Number two, I would like to hand you a letter from the California Reynolds Legal Advocacy and Education Fund, which is outlining their support for denying these appeals. And thirdly, I just want to reiterate that at the public hearings of March 1 and April 9th, I made an offer, public offer, to revise the projects in order to satisfy some of your, ameliorate, ameliorate some of the council concerns regarding some of the issues. And no action was taken on that, but in public and in private afterwards, I talked to people and said we were willing to sit down and negotiate. Uh, no one has taken us up on that offer, which we find a little surprising given the fact that people in Sonoma typically like to uh, work in a consensus standpoint. So that offer still stands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jasper. Do I have anyone else? Yeah. Um, David Iker, 1110 Loma Court. Um, Oh, let me think here a second. So anyway, in terms of negotiation, the applicant does have the opportunity um, to formulate a, a different um, project, downsizing it as one of the uh, issues that uh, the council had, and uh, present it again to the um, planning uh, um, department and then the planning commission. Uh, with his revised uh, option that he had, he said he mentioned here in the uh, in the, the hearing. So I think that's the, the first thing that he does have the opportunity to come up with something different and, and go through that process. Now I'm not sure about um, you know accessibility. I know each and every one of you numerous times has when asked if I could talk to you either in person or over the phone, you've been able to meet. So each of you knows whether or not the applicant has actually requested each of you to, to talk to you to come up to, to find out what each individual problems were and what would a project be that would be acceptable to you. Um, so in any case, I would like you to please uh, pa um, approve the resolutions before you as requested amendment and so that the applicant can also get on with a revised project to go through uh, the the uh, process as uh, per the uh, the code. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Iker. Do I have anyone else who would like to step forward? Forward. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public session.
Thank you, and I'm gonna, I'm looking for direction from our city attorney. Yes, council, we are in receipt of the letters referenced by uh, Mr. Jasper, and we're comfortable with the council proceeding to address these re resolutions tonight. I'd ask that you take each one separately and, and proposing that you add the government code section I earlier mentioned to the last section dealing with judicial review. Thank you. And this is starting with page one, resolution uh, with respect to lower lot two. My, my, mine is page, mine's page six of the oh. entire packet. Um, is there any way to distinguish each of these resolutions? I think it's AKA lower lot two. Okay, the last, the last parenthetical on the title would show you that right. uh, each of the difference. And uh, this is uh, 149 4th Street? Correct. That's where Correct, okay. yes. So the resolution pertaining to that address would be first acted Thank upon. You. Thank you. So are there, is there any discussion regarding this? Okay. Um, I would like to confirm that, in fact, I did, did hear from Mr. Jasper about, you know, wanting to see uh, if we could work out something about the projects, and I do think that going forward that is something that would be good for everybody, um, and even some of the neighbors I've talked to uh, understand that, you know, something will, will go there, and it's not that they don't want anybody there. But unfortunately, I felt that during this point in the process, especially with how contentious has been, there's been lots of threats of lawsuits, uh, I was not comfortable in talking about changing anything. So today, I am prepared to uh, vote on these findings. Uh, and I also support adding the additional code section. Um, and I'm prepared to make a motion unless um, I just want to address the letter from Mr. Jasper's attorney, and in that letter, um, folks haven't seen it, but they demanded that I recuse myself from this vote for bias, and I want to address that briefly. Um, first of all, um, I don't have a personal bias against the applicant or any person that wants to build there. I do favor uh, following the code pretty strictly, and that's what I think we've done here. Um, and so I want to be clear about that. And I would second what Council Member Hundley said, which is you have an absolute right to develop your property in accordance with the law, and I hope that you do bring back projects that are um, more closely in conformity with the rules of the development code. Um, secondly, um, there was an assertion about me advocating um, one way or the other about the project, and I want to be clear about my practices. If any constituent, so for everybody here and everybody watching on TV, if you ever ask me a question about anything that the city is doing, I guarantee you I will bring that question to the city and whatever the city's answer is, I will tell you the answer. And I do that for everything. If you have a question about water rates or development code or how to get a business license or you know, where to renew your dog license, I will take that question to the city and I will give you the answer as soon as I can. A most recent example is somebody told me that the lights near the Safeway were out in the street and I immediately called Kathy Capriola and I said, can we find out how to fix this so I can get back to this constituent? I do that in every case. And in this case, any question somebody asked me about it, I would go right to the uh, city manager and to David Goodison and say, this is what somebody said. What's the answer to that question? Um, I'm proud of doing that. I think that's what a city council member is supposed to do. Um, and so I will continue to do that. And any question you have about the city, if you want to know the answer and you call me or email me, I'm going to ask the city and give you their answer. So um, I'm not going to recuse myself from this vote. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about the matter, uh, meeting with Mr. Jasper. I think I spent hours at the property with his architect. Um, and really reading the code and considering everything everyone had to say at the hearing. Um, I did not have my mind made up until the conclusion of all of the testimony, um, and I support these resolutions, and I think they're in conformity with the clear letter and also spirit of the regulations um, that govern these projects. So, um, I still uh, firmly believe that the um, in people's property rights and uh, being around uh, during the time these guidelines were pulled together, um, I still feel that the um, 
the applicants were interested in, in doing something and coming to some kind of middle ground. Uh, unfortunately, we can't all just sit in a room and help somebody design their home. Um, but I still believe in, as I stated in the previous meeting, that uh, building something reasonable up there um, makes a lot of sense. And I st still feel that it's defensible for uh, the community. And getting into the nitpicking that we got into with, you know, how much cement is, how much the road, how many square feet, all that sort of thing. Um, I still think that there needs to be three uh, well done properties developed there um, because that's what it's zoned for. And so I'm not going to be supporting these tonight. Thank you. Well, th thank you so much. Um, at this point, um, you know, I still support uh, on the f supporting the findings at this point, and so that's how I, I'd like to uh, share that. Could the, our city attorney help us move forward? I think it's now time, if there are any, no further comments from the uh, council, to uh, entertain a motion. And we're going to do these separately. I would like to make a motion to approve a resolution of the City of Sonoma uh, City Council upholding the appeal of the decision of the Planning Commission and denying the adoption of a negative declaration and denial of a use permit to allow a new residence and related improvements on a hillside property identified as 149 4th Street East, aka Lower Lot 2, uh, with the addition of uh, adding Government Code Section 65009. Second. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Cook? No. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? No. Mayor Agramonte? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries 3-1. 2. 3-2. I don't know. I think I made a roll. So the suggestion is that we move forward on each one or would you prefer okay so at this point would you direct us where we're going with this motion I would like to make a motion to uh, approve a resolution of the City of Sonoma City Council upholding the appeal of the decision of the Planning Commission and denying the adoption of a negative declaration and denial of a use permit to allow new residents and related improvements on a hillside property identified as Brazil Street Lot 227, AKA Lot 4, uh, with the amendment of adding Government Code Section 65009. Second. Are there, could we have a vote, please? Councilmember Cook? No. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? No. Mayor Agramonte? Aye. Motion carries 3-2. Well, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be efficient. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve a resolution of the C City of Sonoma City Council upholding the appeal of the decision of the Planning Commission and denying the adoption of a negative declaration and denial of a use permit to allow new residents and related improvements on a hillside property identified as Brazil Street Lot 228, a.k.a. Lot 3, uh, with the amendment of adding Government Code Section 65009. Second. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Cook? No. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Counts Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? No. Mayor Agramonte? Aye. The motion carries 3 2. Where are we now? So we're going, we're moving on. Yes, so we need to go back to 4.1. And um, just need a motion motion to approve 4.1. Correct. Make a motion to approve item 4.1. Second, please. Second. Could I have a roll call? Councilmember Cook? No. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? No. Mayor Agramonte? Aye. Motion carries 3 2. It's not related to this. <laughs> Thank you. Trying to show some consensus. consensus. <laughs> I think we're moving on. Second. We're moving on to 4.5. Correct. Uh, 
uh, so the uh, city clerk will announce the item and, and then we will turn it over to our city manager. This is the second reading and adoption of an ordinance amending the development code by establishing regulations concerning the personal cultivation of cannabis. Thank you, Mayor Agamontine. As council, as I mentioned earlier, this item will not be for action tonight, but we will open for public um, comment, hear any feedback from council regarding this, and, um, and then if council's um, perspective stays the same um, with the 3-2 as it currently is crafted, we'll bring the personal cultivation ordinance back um, on the June 4th meeting. Um, if not, we'll take alternative direction tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn to um, our Planning Director David Goodison. Thank you, Mayor Agramonte and members of the City Council. So right now in Sonoma, the personal cultivation of cannabis is governed under moratoria that have previously been adopted by the Council, um, but as those are uh, by their nature time limited, the Council has directed that permanent regulations addressing the personal cultivation of cannabis be established. And pursuant to the council direction at your meeting of December 4th, 2017, uh, the staff has been working on a regular ordinance that would essentially enact the rules that are, have already been adopted by the council through these moratoria. So the primary provisions are as follows. Indoors, personal cultivation of up to six marijuana plants per residence is allowed subject to restrictions. Uh, indoors includes uh, greenhouse and other enclosed structures, not just the residence. Outdoors, the outdoor personal cultivation of cannabis is prohibited. And uh, based on the council's direction, uh, we've worked with the city attorney to uh, develop a draft ordinance that uh, fulfills those different directions. That ordinance was reviewed by the planning commission um, in January of this year and then subsequently uh, at a public hearing on March 8th at which time the Planning Commission voted unanimously to forward the draft ordinance to the City Council for a re with a recommendation for adoption. At your meeting of April 16th, 2018, the Council held a public hearing on the draft ordinance, at which time the Council voted three to two to introduce it. So that brings us to tonight. Uh, this would normally be a second reading of the ordinance with a re recommendation for adoption. But as the City Manager has stated, uh, that's not possible in a special meeting. So we would just like to take this opportunity to uh, hear from the public and also get uh, direction from the council as to whether this is the direction we're going to continue with. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going out to the public comments. Yeah, unless there's any questions from council members, Are otherwise we're going to public comment. Comments? <coughs> None. I'm going out to the public for comments. Maybe. Uh, my name is John Early. I live on Castle Road. Uh, can I comment on the cannabis issues or just the issue of outdoor growing? You may, John, you may speak just to this yeah, topic, like just to this topic item. So this is just okay. about the personal. And then the next agenda item will be the broader conversation about the council's decision about overall commercial cannabis. All right. And there'll be a separate public comment for that. Thank you. So this is just about personal cultivation um, and this proposed ordinance. Good evening all, Thomas Kennard. I have a question to ask. Can I comment on the previous item, one comment first, before I go on to this? Because there's something really important about, that it seems everybody has missed, including the Planning Commission, regarding hillside development. Oh, you know, that's, uh, you know, Mr. Kennard, I'm already being sued for something, so I would prefer not to share to allow you to move forward. So we're here to discuss personal use, personal well, cultivation. All right, oh, yeah, I'm here now then. All right. Hillside development regulations were put in place to cover properties seen from Broadway, not Brazil Street. If you go back and well, study I the way that now. that was written and put together, you will find that those regulations were put in place as seen from Broadway, not Brazil well, Street. The man on Brazil Street should be able to build what he likes if it falls within guidelines. If you went back in history, take your little time machine and yeah. go back and be there at the times those regulations were put in place, so, that's what they were to cover. Hillside. So, 
the mayor, as seen from Broadway. The mayor Thank is the you. presiding officer of this meeting. The item has already been discussed. It's already been a determination has already been made on that as uh, this is uh, the mayor's decision as to whether this is appropriate as to whether it is relevant uh, to the item then it is uh, up to the mayor um, to control the meeting and determine whether such comment can go forward. I'm a little scared to start controlling meetings um, since I've been legally uh, approached. Um, so um, at this point, I would say no, it's inappropriate to have that at this part. So are there any other public comments regarding the issue? I, I, I do what I'm told when my wife tells me. Um, Ken Brown, 1396 Lubeck Street. It seems to me to be a very simple matter. We live here in Sonoma. Someone has a backyard with a fence. I see no reason why they should be unable to grow, as Ms. Hundley suggested, two plants. Odor and smell is not a big deal. The making of cheese and wine, the running of dairies in Sonoma, elicits horrendous smells. My neighbor doesn't like when my son barbecues because she does a distaste for meat being cooked out on the grill. I understand that. I also understand that there is the ability to mitigate um, cannabis smells by planting lavender, multiple plants. Two plants in your backyard is not going to create some horrible smell. If you're living in a neighborhood inside the city limits of Sonoma and someone has a large grow with dozens and dozens of plants, call the police department. If you don't want to call the police department, I'll call the police department. I have a good relationship with Chief Sackett and have code enforcement deal with your issue. Let's not punish everyone in the city of Sonoma because some outlaw is in your neighborhood. There are people of challenging economic needs in the city of Sonoma. I know that. And to make someone build a greenhouse is just challenging and difficult. Growing indoors is an ecological disaster and also very, very expensive. So I'll just leave it at that. Please vote on the side of your citizens in Sonoma. There was a poll in the Index Tribune. Almost 80% responded in favor of a limited amount of growing in your backyard. I never talked this much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. So my name is Gil Latimer, Grant Court, Sonoma. Good evening to City Council and staff. Uh, just for the record, I'm one of the founders of the Sonoma Valley Cannabis Group and a former member in good standing of the Sonoma County Growers Alliance. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for the work you've done so far to see these issues through. This is an arduous process for us all, and we look forward to moving together for a common cause. Personal outdoor cultivation is very important to us. The state of California and Sonoma County both allow for personal indoor. Last we looked, there were 145 posts, the overwhelming majority of which showed strong support for the personal outdoor cultivation of cannabis. 
Yesterday, the IT published Christian Callen's great article on the subject based on the personal experiences of Sonoma residents who grow their own medication outdoors. We've, we've included a copy for each of you along with other documentation. The IT, as Ken said, also took a poll asking if Sonoma should allow backyard cannabis plants, and the overwhelming majority was just shy of 80% uh, that said yes. The IT said that in its three years of online polling, they couldn't recall a more lopsided result. When faced with facts, the arguments against outdoor cultivation just are not sustainable. Odors can be mitigated. There is no violent crime associated with personal gardens. Cannabis doesn't use any more water than your tomato plants, and fire hazard is much reduced. There are other concerns as well, which due to time constraints we cannot address this evening. However, we definitely look forward to reviewing them in the future should it become, uh, become necessary. And just to end on a bit of levity, there was a cute cartoon here on the editorial page of the IT shows a husband and wife sitting at their kitchen table staring at their uh, potted cannabis plant and she says it should be allowed in the yard just like any other weed I think to which he responded sure it's just kind of the opposite of crabgrass thank you Mr. <laughs> okay. Latimer thank you thank so you. much yeah. that's a tough act to follow isn't it my name is Richard Silver, 95 Bernhard Avenue, uh, Sonoma. I do not live in the city limits. So I certainly uh, am making the assumption I was one of the individuals who sent the email to each of you. And I'm sure that each of you have taken the time, as I did and many others, to read the 55-page PowerPoint outlining all of the particulars regarding the issues that Ken Brown and Gill and others have put forward. Now, an admonition to each of you. First of all, I'm going to follow up on uh, Council Member Harrington's. I'm going to wait. Uh, will you hold my time until you've each gotten that passed out? Because I want my full three minutes. I guess I'm not going to get that waived, am I? Thank you. Uh, will you re reset my clock to two? The clock. The stopped. clock stopped. I all right, but I'm going to go 10 seconds after while this was taken okay. care of. All right. You know what? At this point, everybody can have their own rules. I don't want to be sued. So. I'm not going to sue you, madam. Take a deep breath. This is not an admonition on your legal status. Okay. I'm going to follow on with Ms. Harrington. I want to thank you for bringing to the council and the public a very important word tonight called constituents. You have been extremely responsive to your constituents. Each of you, to my mind, was elected by the constituents. Your responsibility is to the 11,000 people who live within the city limits. The admonition is as follows. You were elected to lead. You were elected to represent the constituents. You were elected to review information, proposals brought to you by your constituents. You were not elected to use your individual personal bias on a singular topic to make a decision that impacts 11,000 people. That's not why you're here. I hope, and if you are, you might recruise yourself or resign. You represent, as does David, Amy, Madeline, Rachel, and Gary, 11,000 people. Your wisdom, your collective experience has been brought to the fore. On this and other topics, I admonish you to put aside an individual bias on a smell or a family member who unfortunately was hit by a car or smokes or had an in unfortunate situation with drug or alcohol abuse. Represent your constituents in making decisions, not your personal bias. Thank you very much. Thank you.
it's a different part of the district. Oh, okay, for the city attorney, this gentleman. We just had the three minutes from the speaker. That means that it's someone else's turn to speak at this point. I'm sorry, Mr. Each, each member of the public gets three minutes to speak on this item, if they so choose, Thank but no you, more. Sir. Good and evening, so Thomas Kennard again. So to the city attorney, can you be clear, we're asking you the question, because this member of the public rose to speak on a prior item, which was not before and was not allowed to continue speaking on that item, is he allowed to speak now, even though he's already spoken during this item, but on a different topic about cannabis? The the rule, as I understand it, of this council is that there is three minutes for each speaker to speak on an item. If a speaker chooses to speak on something else for those three minutes, that is the speaker's opportunity to speak on this item. That rule, uh, I suspect, is subject to uh, change by the council. However. Uh, as I understand it, that is a, a rule of, of the city council that is observed and that is enforced in these council meetings under these circumstances. So your legal opinion is that the current speaker before us does not have the right to make a, what would be a second public comment under your statement that you just made? The speaker, my understanding is the speaker has already had the three minutes to speak on this side. So yes. So based on the rules the council has, um, the council can make a determination that Mr. Kennard has already spoken and therefore is not allowed to speak on this item. And that may have been confusing Mr. Kennard, sometimes it is, um, but at this point Mr. Kennard has had three minutes to approach the council on the personal use cannabis um, ordinance and therefore Mr. Kennard you've used your time and th cannot speak for another three minutes. I and don't believe I used my three minutes up. You will not silence me this way either. We're going to take a recess right now. Thank you.
So I'd like to call the meeting back to order. If our uh, Vice Mayor Harrington and Council Member Hundley would return to the uh, dais, that would be great. Present. <laughs> Present and accounted for. So the question at hand, of course, if Mr. Kennard uh, could speak, and evidently you've heard the decision of the attorney, I have to follow that. I will no longer be facetious about the results of a mayor when they make certain decisions that I have to say. I have to deny your being able to speak. Um, I know, I remember hearing you speak before. I would imagine this council has as well. And um, you actually live in the same neighborhood as I do. So I understand what you're trying to share. So I appreciate you're not coming up again and speaking. I also want to just note that this matter is going to be voted on at a later meeting because we had to change this to a special meeting and not a regular meeting and so there will be another opportunity to make public comment at the regular meeting where the vote will take place and that this is essentially it's similar to almost a study session that we are taking public comment but there will be another opportunity at a regular meeting I believe. Um, that would be true if the vote of the council, I mean, if the conversation of the council on the dais after you close public comment stays the same with a 3-2 vote based on supporting the ordinance as it's currently written. If there is a member of the council that would change their perspective and um, then we would just be having a conversation about potentially allowing some personal outside growing and then we would not be bringing it back on June 4th. Um, because we would be taking different direction from council tonight. That's my understanding from, from legal counsel. So, uh, but a later matter would be coming on the topic of allowing it, and then there would be public comment at that time. Right. Although it would be the opposite side of this issue, it would be the same fundamental. It issue. It would be the same fundamental issue, correct? And there would still be a there still would need to be a, another kind of ordinance written coming back. Yes. So it will be revisited. To re, it will be visited again in one shape or the other. The point being there will be at least one opportunity to give public comment prior to the vote on this matter, not this evening, if you've already spoken once. That's, that would be correct. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So I have open session tonight, tonight and I'm, oh, I'm inviting people to come back up to the dais. Mr. Wagner, you certainly. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Jack Wagner, uh, West Napa Street. I'm speaking on this issue as a citizen and voter in the city of Sonoma. Um, I kind of just want to address the reasons that we got the vote we did at the last reading of this. Um, I think they're talking about, we talked about rights, so I'll get back to that in a second, but we also talked about how if it's two or six or 60, how we'll be able to tell. Um, it's easy to count. Um, we do this already. I want to reference Municipal Code 8.08, .08, which is the keeping of livestock and fowl. And according to the Municipal Code, we're allowed to have 16 chickens in our backyard. Not allowed to have 60 chickens. We're allowed to have 16 on the first 10,000 square feet. Um, now there's different regulations with it. You have to have a coop, but animals are, have different needs than plants. Um, and so it is your right in a residential district to not have a full-scale chicken operation going or a full-scale cannabis farm. But it's not your right to tell your neighbor they can't have any reasonable amount of chickens or, or plants. Um, and so I'd really ask this council to, to use reason maybe and, and compromise on this issue and, and have an ordinance that respects everyone's rights and is a representative of the city and, and their voters. So I thank you for uh, your patience with the process and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Anyone else in the audience or in the, in the audience? Good evening, Council. Uh, Chris Petlock, 426 Napa Road, Sonoma. Uh, I just wanna say there's just nothing more natural than Californians growing things outside. I mean, it seems ridiculous that we would um, have uh, have to grow something like this inside. The other thing I want to point out um, with any of our foodstuffs or medicines, things grown out in the sun, 
uh, tend to be much more vibrant, have much more of the qualities we want from our vegetables, fruits, and so on. And I imagine it would be the same thing for a product like this. Um, so again, you know, it really comes down to uh, compassion for um, people that need it the most. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Petlock. Do we have anyone else? Hi, good evening, Council. Fred Allabach at 195508th Street East. And I've heard on, uh, different council members advocate for property rights before, and this seems like this is a, a property rights issue. And so I would be interested to hear those council members articulate why that growing two marijuana plants in your backyard is not a property right equivalent to building big houses or whatever. So I, I would just be curious to see what that rationale was for property rights and why you would vote against someone's property rights in this case for two plants in someone's backyard. Thank you, Mr. Allabach. Thank you, Council, for your attention to this matter. Uh, my name is Jewel Matheson. I'm a founding member of Sonoma Patient Group, the longest permitted dispensary, cannabis dispensary in Sonoma County. Um, I, I forgot, that, forgot to say I'm at 1396 Lubeck Street. But I'm, I'm actually here um, in uh, standing for my patients and their rights. Um, Sonoma Patient Group has been there for over a decade. We've worked in close collaboration with government and public safety officials to serve the community. Um, this movement began with the Compassionate Proposition 215, the Compassionate Care Act. In that, um, the, the heartbeat of that movement was servicing low-income, disabled, and terminal patients. My job at Sonoma Patient Group is running our Compassion Program. We've been doing that for over a decade, serving terminally ill patients. I want to say that that's been my job, and essentially I'm like the hospice nurse for the cannabis patients in the valley. That's a really hard job to do, taking cannabis to patients that the only medicine that they can access is a really hard job. But what's really a hard job to do now, after the, the laws have changed, is to tell compassionate patients that we can no longer give them free medicine. You're on your own, dying person. You terminal person that we were able to serve, work it out. So my job has become from helping people to, to kind of explain why I can't help them as they die. That's untenable. I, I, I'm having a really hard time with that. Lori Ajax of the Cannabis Control Agency has promised that she would revisit the compassion programs. And there's some exciting legislature coming through, SB 829, which would license and protect compassion programs and give them uh, cannabis that would allow us to give cannabis to low-income and terminal patients. Uh, the Muni services have given you the, uh, the uh, who, who in the county in cities are able to grow outside. Most of them are allowing outdoor grows. Sonoma County is six, Sebastopol six, Cloverdale three, Santa Rosa two, Napa six, Calistoga six. They're all making provisions with certain rules and guidelines. You can't see it from a certain, uh, you have to have fences, you can't see it for a neighbor. There's, you can make those provisions and again, we take a look at what your muni service has done for you. Um, it can be mitigated. You can work out two to three plants. That's not a grow out operation, that's a garden. That's the difference between a low income patient having medicine and not having medicine. I really, I really urge you to do the compassionate thing because two to three plants is not a grow operation. It, it's a simple garden and I would really hope that you would look at the, the human issue here and choose patience over profits. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank you. Uh, David Eicher, Leventon Loma Court, and hadn't planned on um, speaking. However, I, I do want to um, say that there was an article I read in the Chronicle here a few days ago about uh, a nonprofit. They were just giving the uh, cannabis to um, patients that needed it for, the, for medicine, and they had to stop because they still have to pay the tax. They could, in the past, they could be able to get, the, the growers could give them the um, marijuana for, uh, at no cost, but now it's required that they pay the tax. And so, because they didn't have the funds to pay that tax to the growers and distributors, they had to shut down. So, 
you know, the, the other thing that would then, at this time, for the, the patients that need it would be if they could grow their own. Um, and, and so that would be helpful. Now, I, I don't live in the city, but so I'm just I'm giving you this information and let you decide. Uh, I, in the neighborhood that I live in, I did have uh, a, a neighbor, not next door, that did admit that they were growing some marijuana. This was some months ago. And I never knew. I don't know how many plants they're growing, but I can never smell it. So, yeah, I, so I don't know how many plants at what point you would start to smell. Um, so I'll let others maybe could chime in and let you know it, how many is, if it's six, if is it 12, is it 200, uh, or is it two? Um, but I just want to let you know uh, that, that information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iker. Is any, anyone else would like, would anyone else like to speak? I will now close the public session. It's not often that we get to take a pause before we do a s vote on a second reading for an ordinance, but here we are, uh, and I have some comments to make. Um, so I know that we are uh, currently, I'm currently in the minority vote on this, but I just wanted to uh, one more time offer out how uh, low risk we could attempt or we could try this out. There's so many things that we could do to uh, allay a lot of the concerns and also make it so that we aren't putting ourselves in a situation that we can't go back from if it turns out to be a disaster, which I don't think it will be. We could start by having a very small number. I've suggested two and I still support that. I would even go so far as supporting that the plants have to be potted, that they have to be in a secure place, that they have to be a certain distance from their neighbors, that they have to be in a secure locked backyard. Uh, and then. Even more than that, I would support having a required annual license. Uh, I would not want to fee for this or maybe like $5, but that is so we could try this and if for some reason it doesn't work out, we could just change it. Because if there's any concern about having people with plants with vested rights and then we're going down a road that we can't go down, there are so many ways that we could do this where there's no risk. And if it's all a disaster, then we can just step it back. And when it's not a disaster, then we can consider how to lower the barriers even further. Because I do think that uh, right now, between the equipment required for indoor growing uh, and the equipment required for outdoor greenhouse growing, it's a lot of people can't afford that. Uh, even you know, looking at greenhouse prices, it's just something that people can't do. Uh, and you know, as someone who has a garden, uh, actually I'm growing kale in my front yard. It doesn't make sense to me for a city that, you know, claims to be so environmental that we are pushing a plant inside where Sonoma is so good at growing so many things. And the whole point, I think, of Prop 64 in that vote was it is time to move on from this issue. The world is moving forward uh, and I think it is only uh, The only thing that is keeping us stuck in the past are concerns that we can address by regulations. Yeah, I'll go ahead and go next. Um, I've always said cannabis is a fast moving target and when I first came to the council, I looked at um, having the city look into it, staff, and then at the last vote, it was a three to two vote, I was one of them that was um, concerned about enforcement. Um, I still am concerned about enforcement. I spent the last year with constituents calling me saying that there was large grow operations in Sonoma. There were. Police department couldn't do anything about it because we had a glitch in our system. It very upset me. Um, I know that sitting on this council, one thing that the council can do is they can stop, they can hit the pause button, let the world go by a little bit, and then try to figure out how our place in our two square miles would actually um, actually work. It's been very hard. One of the um, uh, public comments 
it's true. I'm for property rights. I mean, on the Jasper appeal, that's one of the reasons that um, I voted the way I voted, because I felt that ordinance was not in, there was too many gray areas, and it went too far. The same thing is with um, uh, cannabis. It's scary, but I would change my vote to direct staff to go back and look at three plants with restrictions. And there has to be some form of enforcement. And it has to be neighbor by neighbor. If a neighbor complains, then that has to be well looked at. Because I've looked at the yards in Sonoma. Some are big, some are small. We live in a very diverse um, um, area. If you look on the east side, you look on the west side. And I don't want to make a vote because I know that two to three percent of the individuals will have a grow operation in their backyard and the cops won't be able to do anything because when they knock on the door they say well we only have two plants go get a search warrant. Um, I don't want to see any any kind of uh, system where somebody has to pay to have these three um, uh, pot plants but I would verily urge if we do move forward, which it sounds like with my vote, this may move forward, um, to look into greenhouses. One of the things that the ordinance as it stands is you can have a greenhouse. And I've priced them on Costco and we've all looked at them. You know, what is a greenhouse? And that's where you get back to this enforcement. Does somebody put two two by fours and a piece of plastic over it and call it a greenhouse? You'd probably get away with it and it'll probably cost you seven or eight bucks. But when I am part of a decision, I want it to be cut and dry. So what I'd like to direct staff is to go back and take a look at some of the other ordinances. I had a long discussion with the city manager this morning about what other jurisdictions have done. I would like to, um, we can mention those if you'd like, but um, one was, you know, it would have to be fenced. It would have to be so far away from, uh, from the neighbor's fence with the important part being that we live in a complaint-driven society, that if there was multiple complaints about this, at least it could be taken care of. And possibly, um, you know, the property, respect, uh, property rights would be respected by both individuals. And that's all I think Sonoma is asking for. So that's my direction to staff. If uh, some council members want to speak on, the, on behalf uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say. So um, uh, this issue I've thought uh, quite a bit about. Um, there's uh, people who have been growing cannabis in their backyards in Sonoma for, I don't know, 50 years. Um, and uh, certain things haven't been noticed. Some have, like the 70 or 80 plants next to Mr. Kennard here. Um, that law enforcement couldn't do anything about, and now we're going to charge them charge people five bucks for a license so that's going to cover you know let's say 500 homes want to do that it's 2500 bucks and typical law enforcement uh, individual is probably I don't know 300 a day 400 a day how are we gonna we can't even we can't even control the smoking in town um, I, I read uh, several of the the multiple canned um, emails that I received that we all received over the week. But what really struck me was when I was walking from the post office yesterday with my nine-year-old daughter and her new little puppy and five teenagers coming up the street with this big box. And I'm in the food business and, I, I, and, and wine business and other things and I have a pretty good nose. I could smell the person who was sm smoking cigarettes who walked in here when we were um, starting our meeting today. Um, but I could smell all f five of these individuals were walking to the plaza with their box. And it's not my place to do anything about it. I, I didn't see what was in the box, but it was clear that they were all, um, had just smoked or, and it, it's just something that we're gonna see a lot more of that um, in town. And it's not something that is something that I wanna see. Um, I'm sorry. So, um, I think the outdoor grows, there's, there's zero uh, enforcement that's gonna happen. It's just, it, it, there's no way we can possibly enforce it. We can't even enforce our smoking ordinance. 
we can't enforce the stop sign down on the plaza where we have the camera. My kids love to watch that, and they say, and they count how many cars go through the stop sign without stopping, usually on Tuesday nights. And it's about 70% who actually don't stop. We can't really enforce all the laws we have. We keep making rules and making rules. I'm in favor of not having outdoor grows. Uh, Friedman Brothers, they're all over this subject. If you go to the Petaluma Friedmans, and I haven't looked at this one, but they have these little greenhouses that are specifically for cannabis, for people's backyards. That's obviously what it's for. They call it for tomatoes, but it's really, and I think they're 29 bucks. Like you say, you, a couple of sticks and some plastic is five, six, eight bucks at the most. So um, I don't have a problem with it, you know people doing what they're gonna do. The state law says you can grow six plants. It's, if it's in a greenhouse, whatever we're gonna do, that's fine. But you know, we used to talk about every issue that came up, oh, water, you know, water or water rights and everything else, or how much water are we using. Now we're we're promoting that. We're you know, we do a lot of things in this town that are we say one thing and then we mean another. And I'm I'm it's to me I'm just against having I'm not against people who, who want to uh, use cannabis, uh, especially for um, as Jewel talked about for medical issues. I'm all for it, but Philip Morris is, I think they're investing $400 million into the cannabis industry. This whole market is changing so fast. And then they talk about all the taxes that are coming in. We're gonna talk about that later. It's nonsense. The taxes are just are going right in the tank. And, and we're not gonna see, we're spending all this time and energy on all this wonderful money that's gonna come in, but guess what, it's not coming. And if you look at what the state's talking about, it's just not coming. Maybe we'll hear something new later, but um, I'm not in favor of, of everybody in town. And I think when you talk about the IT polls, I mean, come on, it's 200 and something people. There's 11,300 people in this town. And if I saw 9,000 people saying, yeah, let's go for it. Um, but what you're gonna see is you're gonna see farmers, I'm in the farming industry, they're just gonna, you know, as long as there's money to be made, they're gonna start ramping up and continue to ramp up. And, you know, uh, based on how our government's going, People are going to have access, and I believe that um, if everybody has to grow their own who wants to, there's nobody who's going to go knock on your door and ask you if you're growing pot in your backyard, because there's a lot of people that, who do it in Sonoma. And if the city manager could, or uh, David Goodison, you might know, how many people have we arrested in Sonoma for growing pot in their backyard? I can't say that I do know the answer to that question. My apologies. I'll bet it's pretty close to zero. So. Those are my comments, and I'm going to hold my position. Well, well um, I don't want to be a broken record since we've talked about this enough. I'm uh, enthused by Councilmember Cook's uh, change of heart. I think um, that the last thing we should be involved with is regulating what plants you can grow in your backyard. I'm not really interested in pursuing that um, with regard to other adults, but um, I also think that there are people that are growing it now that are subject to um, criminal penalties and that um, is very serious and dangerous for folks and and to the extent that people are doing that I and there's an opportunity to decriminalize that behavior I support putting that into law um, I think three plants would be great I think just like we have other setbacks we could have a setback for this that's something that we understand how to do and there's other regulations about it, um, probably creating an administrative permitting um, would be, and I understand the reason for suggesting that, which is to compromise and try and make everyone feel comfortable, so I think that's a good offer, but I think that the more administrative um, apparatuses we set up, the more costly it is, so probably if we have comfort with not doing that, I would think that would be better. Um, but I also want to say, and this is in in some regard to things I've heard and also to some public comments that have been made that um, I think it absolutely has to be all right for people to disagree. And so the council members who do not support growing marijuana in your backyard, that's okay also. And we don't have to have group think and we all don't have to have the same ideas. And I think it's really healthy in a democracy to allow other people to have other ideas and all of our, um, you know, no matter how neutral and logical we think we are, all of our intellectual endeavors are somewhat informed by our personal experiences. And so we have people with a variety of background and experiences, and those are all super valuable and important. And I think, you know, I've heard things like, 
if people don't support marijuana, we're going to make sure that they can't win re-election. And I think those are, um, you know, I hate to say it, but I think those, some of those are kind of toxic thoughts because we can have a variety of opinions on topics. Not everyone has to agree with us on every topic. And I get it. It's super important. And I hope it passes. And I totally support it. But I also equally support the right of other people to not agree with me and to have had super negative experiences, especially with their own children or close family members who marijuana was really a problem. And I think many of us, myself included, know teenagers especially who had serious problems with marijuana, who got into smoking too much, and it really took them off track. And that's a powerful personal experience. So I completely support having three plans. I think that's fantastic and a good move, but I also hope that in our discussions we can acknowledge that people that don't disagree with us, they do represent other people's ideas just because they're not my own. And I think even on the hillside appeal, people have different perspectives and I am glad that that there are different voices on the city council that represent different members of the community. And I, I think that's super important. And, um, and I think for the people that uh, that share especially minority opinions that don't win, it's really important for them to hear their ideas voiced as well. Um, and I really respect that. And so to people who don't agree on this, and we have received a lot of communication that impacts, you know, um, basically I support your right to also have disagreeing ideas. I think that's um, really important, especially in our like current climate, which is like people that don't agree with me, I don't wanna hear what they have to say. I do want to hear what they have to say, and I hope that it sharpens my own arguments and really uh, that I have to incorporate that into my own thinking um, and improve what I have to say about a matter. So um, I hope that we can change the direction tonight. Thank you, Council Member Cook, and also Council Member Hundley. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I the first person that ever politically used polls was President Rockefeller. And everybody was against him in his decision making. He didn't care. He said, you know what, I'm going with what I believe in. And I think that's what Council uh, Vice Mayor Harrington was hinting at. Um, for me, I, I think I've heard from uh, Council Member Edwards, you, a person who wants to grow in their backyard, that's a freedom. I guess it's a property right. What about my freedom? Where does my freedom go with the smell? Where, what happens? What do, I, what do I do? I'm, you know, one of the biggest things I've heard um, is enforcement. I don't know how this gets enforced, so I don't think it matters. In fact, I don't even think we should be wasting our time here, all these meetings, all this stuff we've read. People are growing it anyway. This woman was on the uh, front page of the Sonoma Index proudly showing her little plant in the backyard. Why are we even doing this? If everybody's going to grow, in spite of possibly my, my feelings about certain things, I'm involved with an organization that looks out for young people who are involved in, in drugs, which in, you know, and alcohol in this city um, that has been tolerated for so many years. And those are my concerns for the young people. And children, I was told, um, you know, the packages are now made as un unattractive as possible. But when we sell it, it's not my responsibility anymore. It's the parents' responsibility. I don't get that one. Um, so, you know, I, I can't, I cannot change uh, the way I feel. I, you know, as, as uh, uh, Vice Mayor, Harrington said we all have different experiences. Um, I'm really concerned for the kids in this in this city, and um, with all due respect to the Sonoma Index, I don't know what methodology you used for your survey. I could have called 30 times and said, "Yep, that's what I want." I have no idea. I have respect for you, but I'm just that's why I mentioned President Rockefeller because I thought that was probably you know pretty scientific. Um, but I just wanted to share that. Uh, I do not agree uh, at this point. I, Gary Edwards and I are here. Um, and I think this is a moving target. Who knows what I'll think in two years or one year or eight months. I can't answer that. But the responsibility now will be for the people who feel free to grow in their backyards. And if they end up with 50 or 40 plants, 
Okay, go ahead. It doesn't matter. So um, I don't know. I think at this point I'm looking for a. Okay, Gary. I just want to add one thing to it is that um, so we have a real estate driven economy here, um, along with our tourism, and we're gonna we have people you know that bought their house for three hundred thousand dollars, paying three thousand dollars a year in taxes, and we have people that are buying their houses for two million and three million dollars in some of paying twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year in taxes. So I think whatever you guys decide to do, it sounds like there's a majority that we have to make sure that the real estate industry has full disclosure of, and there there has to be some sort of thing. So because when somebody comes to buy a house, there's going to have to be some sort of disclosure that they're growing cannabis in their yard. I mean, next door, next door or I mean, it just has to be part of it. So I mean, I think that's something to consider of the folks that are paying, um, you know, people that are growing it are paying taxes as well. But my point is, is that it's going to be something that's going to have to be disclosed. Where do we go from here? Okay. So, Council, I believe where we go from here, what I've heard is um, we have new direction from the Council. Uh, again, the staff takes this direction from Council as a whole. So instead of a 3-2 to, to prohibit any outdoor growing of cannabis um, at residential, it now is a flip the other direction. And what I'm hearing, because I know that the past conversation with Vice Mayor Harrington and Councilmember Hundley was to talk about two plants. And what I'm hearing now is an offer by Councilmember Cook to three plants with some parameters that staff would need to do some research and come back with. Um, issues about setbacks, maybe it's, there's a little bit of a, maybe a beta testing where they're potted or, so I think there's research we have to do. I know we've looked at some other ordinances where there's actually a complaint process where if there is, you know, maybe there is a sensitivity issue with someone next door. So um, there, that whole complaint process, I think we want to look at at some other cities and how they have done that. Uh, so, but there are some parameters that we staff would want to research and bring you back some recommendations. Um, and then with that, move forward and go to planning commission and then um, back to council. Uh, so with that, I, if that captures overall feedback, that's but oh, I passed oh, my hand in. Um, I guess I didn't realize that the planning commission was involved, which is fine, but what is their role? Their role is to review. So I think what we do is we want policy direction from the council. So what we have is general policy direction, but we don't have some of the specifics, and I think we'd want to talk about that a little more. So we may, I, I'm looking at Mr. Goodison, but my thought is we'd probably come back to you for a brief conversation about here's some of the types of parameters you can put around this, get a sense of what council's thoughts are, and then go draft and bring an ordinance to the planning commission for them to vet, and then it would come back to you. Gary? So just doing a quick little research here in Southern Oregon, they're talking about 15 foot cannabis plants in rich soil and bright sunlight, et cetera. So are we gonna have a height limit on this? Or is that, because our fence ordinance is six feet high. So we, mm -hmm. we should be thinking about that sort of thing to help prevent that visibility issue that. Um, most of the visibility, most of the ordinance, and I'll look to if there's anything else the team has seen here and I'll ask our consultants in the back, but most of what I've seen so far is visibility from the front and then distance from fence lines um, so that it's not visible from a public right of way. That's part of what, and that you um, sometimes there's restrictions not allowing them in like a multifamily, um, that type of thing. So there still could be some parameters based on maybe the densification of the housing units because I think that is a difference. Um, based on the size of lots. So that's, again, looking at some of those setbacks and some of that issue to get to, I think, some of the neighborhood issues that have been discussed. And I think if, as long as we're looking at that, we might look at possible, what's the enforcement going to be like, if there's such a thing? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, just like a lot of our code enforcement, again, because we're not, we don't have an officer on every street and we don't have a code enforcement officer on every street. So um, it's we, we do do targeted enforcement and then we do complaint driven enforcement. Um, 
So I think there's, but there are some folks that have been doing this for a little bit in some research we could come back and provide some options for council. And I think in a fairly brief staff report, just provide some um, different components and get some general thoughts from you um, when it's agendized a little more differently and then um, move it back through planning commission, et cetera. So with that, I would say that is the direction there would not, that I hear and there would not need to be a formal vote. Right, it sounds like there is a direction three to two and looking, and you'll pass that by us. What, I mean, Gary has made some good suggestions, uh, suggestions to the planning commission, what we're asking them possibly to, uh, to you know, to review. Yes, we'll be, because I think we're planning on coming back to you one more time before we go to planning commission. All right. All right. Is there a time limit for making this ordinance? I know we have the time limit on um, the regulations. Is that also October? I believe it's November. Okay, so this has to be resolved one way or the other by November. Okay. All right, thank you very much. So we are done with item 4.5. So at this, uh, our city clerk, 6.1. 6.1 is review discussion and possible action on options for the local regulation of commercial, medicinal, and adult use cannabis activities. So I'm, at this point, I'm gonna turn that over to the city manager slash planning director to give staff report and a presentation. Yeah, so this presentation we've led by the planning director and then we have Muni Services with us. Um, and I'll hand it over to David. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Agramonte and members of the City Council. Oh, is it um, cold? It's cold, they're saying. Is it cold? Good. She turned it on. We want to um, get this forward to public comment and to <coughs> council direction, so we're going to try to keep our presentation tight. Um, but just to summarize my part, uh, similar to, well, not similar, identical to um, what is the case with personal cultivation. Right now, uh, commercial cannabis activities in Sonoma are limited by a moratorium that's been adopted by the city council. And in essence, it doesn't really allow for any commercial cannabis activity whatsoever, with the limited exception of deliveries from dispen licensed dispensaries located outside of city limits. But again, a moratorium is a time-limited um, thing that is intended to allow an opportunity for the development of permanent regulations. So that is what we have been engaged in for uh, some period of time now. With the most recent council direction received over the course of meetings held in December of 2017. At that point, the council directed staff to proceed with a community-based process to investigate and explore options related to medicinal dispensaries, as well as cannabis testing and manufacturing. And uh, this phase is intended to culminate tonight with the City Council providing direction as to whether or not to proceed with developing regulations allowing uh, such facilities. If that direction is given to proceed, uh, is given, then the next step would be to proceed with developing an ordinance allowing uh, whatever those uses might be as defined by the City Council, uh, as well as um, developing and implementing measures related to cost recovery and depending on uh, the structure of the regulations to implement a dispensary selection process. So that's kind of the nutshell overview. Throughout this process, we've been assisted by Muni Services. They've been really invaluable in helping us do a lot of research in, uh, in organizing the workshops because as has been mentioned, this is a very fast moving and complex area of the law right now. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Jeff Collin and Larry Bergkamp with Mini Services uh, with just the final added note that um, this is an abbreviated version of the slide presentation that was included with the packet. Uh, we have all of the slides with us tonight if there are things that council members want to call up. But again, in the interest of just moving the discussion forward, we're just trying to hit the highlights. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodison. Um, I think we need to get the slideshow up on the screens. That I'm going to need uh, the city clerk's assistance. 
So as uh, we're working on that, um, I'm Jeff Colin with Muni Services, and next to me is Larry Bergkamp. Uh, we are both uh, um, advisors on uh, the cannabis industry, and we've been uh, uh, very pleased to be working with uh, the city council and members of the Sonoma community for the last several months to help uh, learn more about the cannabis industry, uh, share a whole bunch of options on regulations and uh, controls and permitting processes. Um, the next slide we have talks about what's allowed in Sonoma now. And really, uh, Director Goodison has covered most of these points already. Um, right now, we have that moratorium in place. We don't have any business that's licensed for on-site consumption. Uh, we've gone over the possession uh, limits uh, that an individual person can have, um, about one ounce or eight grams of concentrated cannabis. And we've just talked about personal use and personal growing limits and gotten some direction from the city council regarding that. Tonight, uh, what we hope to do is talk more about commercial cannabis activities that we've been exploring for the last several months, including medicinal and possible adult use dispensaries, uh, manufacturers, both adult and medicinal, as well as testing labs, which currently don't have a designation at the state level that defines any difference between medicinal or adult use testing labs, and possible delivery um, uh, of medicinal cannabis, both by businesses that could be located within Sonoma, as well as continuing to allow delivery from outside the city. And so we wanted to make sure that the council understood that all of those options uh, are in our presentation tonight, as well as the step-by-step -step process that we'll be going through a little bit later this evening. I'm going to turn it over to Larry now to talk a little bit about the regulatory options uh, before the city of Sonoma. Okay, first we want to go over a little bit of as far as the uh, what's going on in your community or, ran, or around the community. And, and this next slide basically provides some information on the various different cities in the area that allows permitted dispensaries, dispensaries with other cannabis type businesses, and then uh, has, has prohibited dispensaries. And within those, you can see like some of those, even though they've prohibited dispensaries, they've allowed some kind of uh, medicinal grows and deliveries and some manufacturing. So it gives you an idea of what's going on in the region. And also note, as mentioned before, is this is an always changing list because it's a moving target. Things are going on um, throughout the area, throughout the cities and the counties around to uh, determine what they're going to be allowed. And, and some of them are going through the process of trying to license the or businesses, but they haven't finished that process or the licenses haven't been approved or been denied for various different reasons. So it's a very changing uh, environment. So the next slide is basically the city regulation options. <coughs> and as Jeff mentioned, it's basically broken down into um, the various different types of uses, which is um, delivery only, dispensary, adult use, which is a uh, uh, retail sales, manufacturing and testing. Those are the uh, categories that uh, the city is looking at. Some of the other issues to consider are also the siting locations and the zoning and distance requirements. Um, the state has set, set up some mandatory buffer zones for uh, schools, K through 12, uh, of 600 feet, um, and then youth centers and other private facilities. The city does have some discretion as far as allowing those, um, those buffer zones, and we'll talk about that in, uh, shortly as far as uh, some options that the city has to, to consider. Um, the city can also determine other sensitive areas that they can identify as far as uh, whether they want to allow the, the industry within those areas or not. So this next, uh, this next slide. This next slide uh, is an illustration of the state mandated school buffer zones of 600 feet. And so those blue circles on the map uh, indicate the buffer zone around those K through 12 schools. Um, parks are indicated in green, schools in blue, and then the buffer zones in that dashed blue line. And I would like to just chime in here. We've researched this area 
and had a number of conversations with uh, legal staff, and we believe that this buffer zone, in terms of it being a hard limit, does apply to collective dispensaries. Yes, so under the Health and Safety Code, there is a 600-foot requirement for medicinal dispensaries that are of the collective variety that uh, was authorized under the Health and Safety Code that have a storefront or a delivery. And I know that there's been some discussion about other cities. We've checked with other cities, and I think there is consensus that under state law, there is a 600-foot radius requirement for those facilities. Go ahead. Oh, I have two questions. What is a collect What do you mean by a collective? What does that mean? A collective is the type of facility that was created through the Compassionate Use Act, where there is a primary caregiver that provides cannabis to qualified patients that uh, was created before the Adult Medical Use Act that allowed for non-medicinal um, cannabis consumption. So those collectives pre-exist the licensing scheme. And for those collectives, there is the 600-foot radius requirement from schools that have any grades from kindergarten through 12. So can you... Uh be a medical marijuana dispensary without being a collective? You can now be a medical marijuana retail establishment, which we would call a dispensary that is licensed by the state. Collectives do not go through the licensing scheme. So and they will be, they will be sunsetted sometime uh, early 2019 or late 2018. So all of the businesses, since we don't currently have any retail establishment, all of them would be new businesses. So then anyone who wanted to could elect to either be a collective, which would be sunsetted, which I imagine any savvy business person would not establish, or not be a collective so that they could continue on. So isn't it sort of a moot point because these would be new businesses getting licenses from the state? Why would they get a license to be a collective if that's being sunsetted? Why is that relevant? Excuse you. me. So there is no, there is no licensing for collectives. If the ordinance were to go into effect tomorrow, or the ordinance were to go into effect in a couple of months, during that period of time, that collectives could be existing because they would not need a license from the state. Those collectives would be operating within the city. And those collectives are required under state law to be 600 feet away from schools. So that, that's the hard requirement. That's not something the city has decision-making authority over. But since they are to be sunsetted, there will be medis that there, may, there can be medicinal marijuana dispensaries that are licensed that the city does have decision-making over as to the radius between the dispensary and the school. So under the new statutory scheme, which will encompass 100% of retail operations after the collectives have sunsetted, which is the future of everything that will be, we do in fact have the right to uh, set the appropriate limit from a school, correct? That is true for all of those licensed uh, facilities. Yes. Right. Yes. So for everything, every single person who has a retail establishment will have to move over away from the collective model into the license model. That's a requirement since it's going to be sunsetted. So for the future of medical marijuana retail, there will be discretion as to how close it can be to a school. Yes? That's a, a fair uh, statement. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> The, the answer is yes, and now we don't have to show our next two slides because that's basically what we are moving towards. So could I ask a question? And it goes back to the smoking ordinance. I can't remember, 600 or 1,000. I can't remember. I have a question. We, um, Excuse me. I have a question. Well, okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't want to hurt your 
feelings. Um, I'm what, sorry, Mary. I'm like, I'm I don't know off the top. Moving, I don't moving. know. I, we could. I, we can look quickly in the meeting code and get back to you. But I don't know off the top. Okay. I just want to know, just for clarification. We ended up picking not having a map because we aren't allowing any new tobacco retailers. However, when we had a map, it was a thousand feet. That's what I thought. Thank you. Uh, but there was no decision made as to what youth, uh, whether it applied to youth designated areas or whether it was just schools. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Then I think the only comment that I would add is if the city did not take action on buffer zones, then the default would fall to the state 600 foot limit. And that's the only add comment we'd make at this point. The next two slides were really illustrations of other local buffer zone examples. I think we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on those. Uh, they showed an expanded buffer zone option and then a no buffer zone option. Uh, and at this point, we'll go back to the next section, which is Just, um, tax. Sorry, tax before, Jeff, before you go back to the yeah. no buffer, I think the one run reason to show the no buffer example here is council, you could also decide, again, not going to put any buffers on, but you're going to decide based on certain zoning areas that you are not going to allow them in a mixed use or you would somewhere else. So that is another type of, it's another separation tool um, that you could consider differently than buffers. Yes. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Larry for some discussion on tax and fee options. OK, and as we've discussed as far as the tax and fees, um, this slide basically shows the, the base rate for um, the taxes on the cannabis industry. The, the uh, chart shows the sales and use tax. The base rate is 7.25%. And, and then on top of that is any district taxes that are effective in the, in the city. And then on top of that also is the state has imposed a 15% gross receipt sales tax on both um, medicinal and adult use. And I should mention that the sales tax is currently exempt from um, tax on uh, medicinal use. And the state's also added cultivation taxes of $9.25 uh, uh, $9 per ounce of flowers, $2.75 per ounce of leaves, and then also $1.29 per ounce of freshly harvested cannabis within two hours of being harvested, within the first two hours. And then the last part is where um, the city can impose various different taxes on um, the cannabis businesses, and they can impose them on all different types of cannabis uh, business type activities, imposing a gross receipts tax, which would be a percentage tax, square footage tax would be on the square footage of the, uh, the footprint of the operation and also on a quantity tax uh, based on uh, ounces or uh, quantities of the product. The city is also allowed to impose uh, reasonable administration fees to reasonably oversee and administer the industry. And those fees can also be broken down in various different categories through an application fee, licensing fee, renewal fee, and ongoing administration fee. And primarily they have to go f to um, cost recovery of city resources and expenses with regard to the industry. The next slide is just an overview of some of the information as far as possible revenue um, expectations from the industry. Um, the industry is evolving and changing, and there's not a, uh, even though medicinal cannabis has been, been sold in California for a number of years, um, the state has not been able to capture actual sales information, information coming out for the first quarter for uh, uh, legalized cannabis has come in lower than expected, um, but that's also the first quarter and the regulations have not, are still under emergency status, and so there's still applications in process and other various issues that could impact that revenue. Um, you want to wait at least uh, probably a, a couple of quarters or through the year to find out what uh, the true sales might be. But looking at the, the information, a, a, an average cannabis dispensary would generate anywhere from $800 to $1,000 per square foot. An average cannabis dispensary is, is probably around 900, 900 square feet. And below that is just some summaries for uh, information on various different uh, operations in uh, Sacramento and Palm Springs that we've provided as far as uh, the different sizes and the revenue expectations based on the, uh, the tax rates and amounts. Okay, now we're looking at, and, and when we talk about the taxes and the resources, you're looking at the resources that the city might uh, need to administer and oversee the the industry, um, and just listed there is a number of different areas um, within the city with regard to planning, inspections, 
um, building safety, compliance, preventage program, pre prevented prevention programs, education, um, various different areas that the city would have to look at to, to determine their oversight cost and resources needed to oversee these. Some cities have looked at more low cost and self-reporting processes uh, with regard to the industry. Um, and one of those be, a lot of those are self-reporting, um, and usually it depends on the number and, and operation of the uh, businesses allowed. But uh, with his, this industry being a cash-based industry at this point, being a new industry, um, we, we would recommend an uh, initial oversight to be looking at it, and then depending on how the business operates, like any other business, if it's a good business operation and operating as it should be without any issues, uh, compliance and enforcement will probably re, uh, be reduced over the years as it uh, as it moves forward. Could I ask a question about the cash? Um, I understand there's a lot of different pieces of legislation. How? What's their? What's the progress? Where's you know? Where is all of that? Uh, within the state and even at the federal level, there's been a lot of uh, different issues come up with regard to the cash. Currently, right now, um, banks can accept. Uh, cannabis uh, revenue from the businesses if they follow a number of different procedures and follow through and, and it turns out a lot of the banks are, are not willing to go through those uh, steps at this point because the uh, enforcement or the impacts could be drastic if they miss a step or, or fail to do something certainly but California has looked at doing coming up with uh, uh, California State Bank there's been some issues looking at uh, credit unions and various different operations um, there's a lot of different types of uh, like uh, third party type cash payments, PayPal, and some other ones that are coming on board and trying to bridge the gap um, currently. And at the federal level, there, there has been some softening of that, but we don't know how, how far that will go if they uh, loosen the rules sufficiently where the banks will feel comfortable taking the money. But right now, it's, it's primarily a cash-based business. Mayor Grimani, if I can just add one item to this too. Should council decide tonight to give us direction and move forward, there, the staff impact to this, um, I would want us to be looking at outsourcing, kind of how do we do this, at least initially, um, because this is, um, one, there's a learning curve, two, that we want to um, find a firm that's kind of done this and helped other cities do this. Um, it depends on what exactly, if council does move forward, what, but, and we, um, the ability with your current staff to absorb a large inspection program or something like that, again, um, we'd want to do some research, um, but it, we may be coming back looking at some kind of contract staff or contract help. I might be off subject, but when we, when we toured the labs, uh, do they have a, I, I think they were saying they needed a lot, a, a, a pretty good amount to be able to test it. And I think people didn't, uh, whatever the business didn't really want to give too much you know obviously because it takes it out of the the, the uh, their sales so is there a minimum that uh, a lab will take in terms of a sample size sample size you know for pesticides for whatever their test they at the lab they explain different things to us it depends on the size of the crop and the product that's being tested oh, okay. um, it has to be an appropriate size sample so that it's representative of the overall crop being tested. Random. It's like, ran it would be random? Is that what you're saying? No. It's based on the size of the crop being tested and the type of product that's being tested. Okay. Thank you. We could get you more detail on, on those standards. The, the next slide we have um, talks about the authorized commercial cannabis businesses' next steps. And we're, we're not assuming that that decision has been made yet. The council still clearly has the option of saying, no, we don't wish to proceed further. We're going to um, stay with our current ban on commercial cannabis businesses. But if you do choose to move forward, with one or more of the business types that we described at the beginning of the presentation. This is a tentative calendar that lays out some of the major steps that are before you that you would need to move through in order to be able to begin to issue business licenses as of January 1 of 2019. So tonight, we're hoping that we'll get direction on the 
number and types of businesses that the city may be interested in developing. We wanted to get feedback on the zoning maps, both the types of zones where commercial cannabis industries would be permitted and the buffer zone question. Following receiving that information, uh, we would then begin to work on development of ordinances and regulations with your city attorney and staff. We would also complete uh, a study of resources, some of the things that your city manager just mentioned about uh, enforcement, inspection, um, permitting processes, uh, background checks and the like that are part of this process, and what it would take in terms of resources to do those things. Then based on uh, direction from council again, we would begin to develop a tax rate and fee policy. We'd be uh, talking about some of those things tonight to get some preliminary idea of interest and which direction you wish to pursue, and then come back in probably the middle of July with a policy. In August, uh, there's a deadline to file uh, tax ballot measures, and so we'll need to have uh, that tax policy discussion and understand the structure of a tax measure that would be placed before the voters by that August deadline. Um, during the interim period uh, between the filing of the ballot measure and the actual election date, we would be developing that application process for the types of businesses that you wish to um, um, consider permitting. And then in September, uh, we develop an objective and merit-based selection process. And in, during the October period, we begin that administration of the selection process. In November 6th is the election. Um, that would be on the tax measure. And then um, middle of December, we would hope to complete the selection process to determine which businesses would be recommended for permits. These dates are flexible with the exception of the election date and the date for filing the, the measure uh, and will be based on city council direction as we move forward. Um, I do have a question with respect to medical dispensaries. Could I ask a question? If a city started out that way, do you know about the propensity of just going to commercial as well? So I mean, is, a do is it a door opener? I, I don't know. I'm just asking the question. I, I wouldn't call it a door opener um, for having a medicinal only retail operation. It's yet to be determined um, what the market pressures will be and the economics will be in the future, mm -hmm. whether a medicinal only retail outlet will be able to survive in the long term or not, or whether there's an advantage to also having an adult use retail location um, co-located with the medicinal uh, dispensary. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next slide um, we'll be revisiting in more detail a little bit later in the evening. Um, and this shows the uh, dispensary options grid, which will be used as a guide to walk the council through the various decisions um, and questions that we hope to get addressed this evening. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it right now. Um, I think the council will probably want to have a question and answer period for staff and our uh, consultants and then take some public input and then we'll come back to this decision matrix both for the dispensary options as well as the testing labs and uh, manufacturing options, which are the next two slides, I believe. So, um, yeah, go ahead. And to, this is the tax recovery um, slide, which shows uh, the decision matrix uh, that I mentioned earlier about the question of do you want a tax? If you do want a tax, um, what structures you're looking at. Um, is it a gross receipts tax? Does it have a maximum limit? Um, some of those types of questions that will help you give us guidance as to the policy to develop. And then we also have the cost recovery section, which is 
do you want full cost recovery? Do you want something less than full cost recovery in order to assist with the establishment of businesses initially? Um, it's those kinds of questions and policy direction that we'll be looking for. So we promised to try to be quick tonight. I think we, we were marginally successful in that. We're, these wrap up our slides for the time being. Thank you. Uh, we can turn it back to staff and the city council at this point. So, um, Mayor and Council, um, so we're happy to take any questions from Council before you go out to public comment. Um, if I could have um, the consultants put back the kind of the dispensary slide first, because that's the slide that we're going to start on. And here, really, what we're looking for first from each council member is we need to know um, there's really four roads here. Um, option A um, is medicinal delivery from outside dispensaries only, which we, would mean we do not have a, a Sonoma dispensary. Option B would be a local medicinal dispensary only, but no storefront delivery only. Option C is a medicinal dispensary with being allowed in Sonoma with storefront and delivery, and you might also allow deliveries from outside. And the last option would be um, both medicinal and adult use um, retail and a dispensary. So when we come back um, after questions and public comment the f and we start, the first question we'll be asking each of you is really this question because once we know where the majority of council is on this, then we're determining um, if we're spending a time on the rest of the sub questions. David? I guess I have the big question about the white elephant in the room would be uh, what happens if the initiative, um, it goes to the voters? Um, there's something being passed around right now. Can we talk a little bit about what's going on with that? Because uh, what, what would the council be able to do uh, at that point? And that's kind of where I would like to start the conversation. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm looking to kind of our legal team because we have both um, John Abachi and Jeff Walters and they've been splitting some of this work within the team so I'm not sure who is the best person to answer that question. I'll give it a shot. Uh, the initiative um, has some unresolved legal issues uh, that are uh, built into it so it's unclear whether it's a lawful document and lawful uh, piece of legislation that still needs to be resolved. Um, also, uh, when it gets on the ballot, if it gets on the ballot, is uh, unclear. Um, and the, the council may in fact have adopted uh, a regulatory scheme um, before it even reaches a ballot. Um, and whether or not then this initiative measure that would not address and, and doesn't address um, what the council may already have uh, approved will affect that is a question that's unresolved. So there are a lot of unresolved questions because the initiative assumes there's nothing in place. There are no existing regulatory schemes, no uh, dispensaries being approved, et cetera. So how that would then marry with a, a scheme that the council has already approved uh, has not yet been resolved. Uh, remember, they need to get a certain number of uh, signatures on the, the measure, and depending on when they uh, submit it to the council. Those signatures have to be verified uh, by the county election department. Um, and sometimes they don't get sufficient signatures within the prescribed period of time and then they need to start over. Um, and even if they get the prescribed number of signatures, the city has a, a period of time within which to examine the measure for its legal sufficiency uh, before it gets to the council. So there are a lot of steps still uh, yet to be taken to determine whether or not this is a real issue for the council to grapple, to grapple with. And, and the questions are, are yet to be answered. So I don't have a clear answer for you because I don't exactly know what you all may decide to do. It may fit in very nicely with what this initiative measure proposes. I don't know. Um, it may not. There may be conflicts and how those are resolved is a question we'll have to address uh, down the road depending on those conflicts that may, that may arise. So there's no clear, clear answer to your question. I, I apologize for that, but there are so many unknowns and moving parts yet uh, that prevent uh, such an answer from being 
being uh, offered to you at this time. Thank you. Vice Mayor wants to. I just want to clarify, um, and I'll frame this as a question, but for the public, um, the current proposed ballot measure, which may or may not make it on the ballot, is for unlimited adult and medicinal dispensaries in the town of Sonoma subject to buffer zones. Is that right? That is correct. And so we're talking about if we were to say whatever the number is between one and three medicinal, that this ballot would be saying that there would be unlimited, it's basically like a retail operation by right for um, adult and medicinal, and that's the competing, competing idea. It is, with, with very limited oversight by the city. And I have a question. With respect, before, before we move forward, if, uh, with respect to delivery, can you tax deliveries coming into a city? Thank you. And Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. we, we authorized deliveries a while back. And we I know there's people being delivered cannabis in Sonoma. Right. The moratorium has an, there's a, 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 a business moratorium, a, ca a cannabis business moratorium. Mm -hmm. There is carved out an exception for deliveries from out of, out of the city for medicinal purposes. That, that moratorium will expire unless extended by the, the council in November. So even if we waited a while, um, there is no issue of people actually being able to order their cannabis right now, medical and otherwise. Even if we waited? I mean, no, we, we I mean it's happening now. Oh, it's happening now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's allowed right now. Oh, but not for adult use. That's correct. So where would you, where do we go now? Are we opening for public comments? Any other questions for the council? Otherwise, you if you're ready to open public comment. Thank you. So I'd like to open it right now to for public comments. Good evening, council and city staff. This is Fred Hollabach at 195508th Street East. Um, I got an anthropology degree with a um, <coughs> subcomponent in archaeology, and I also took a really fun college class called Plants and Human Affairs. And about 10,000 years ago, when agriculture was just getting started, the archaeologists find evidence of wine and marijuana. So these are old plants in human history, and I see that Sonoma has pretty well got its um, cart hitched to the horse of wine which is, a, which is an intoxicant that goes to the brain and hits the pleasure centers in basically the same way as marijuana. So that uh, Sonoma basically has a, a Dionysian type of culture of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And that's where the tax money and the revenues for the city comes from is, is this particular lifestyle. So I think that it's, it would be really hypocritical of the city to not allow one of the oldest substances from the initial agricultural revolution of human history to go along with the wine. And so in that respect, I would suggest that the city go for uh, the option of, of um, the most possible marijuana sales at the highest tax rate so that the city will get as much money as they can out of it and come, come out of it strong. Go for as much money at a start because then that will be setting the, setting the, uh, the floor for, for what you're going to get. And the city is possibly going to need money in the future for various reasons. And people have talked about diversifying the economy. So this is a perfect opportunity to diversify the economy, generate some income, and go along with what the voters wanted is to have have marijuana be legal um, you know people have been hiding and and doing illegal things with it for so long now's the chance to bring it out and why not make as much money as you can off of it if it's going to be legal um, put it in a place where there won't be any kids around there's some empty lots in Armstrong estates maybe you could put one over there um, would be a good place, you know, not any kids around there. And uh, go for as much money as you can. That's my, my suggestion. Go 
Good evening once again. Am I free to speak for a moment? Thank you very much. Uh, my first portion I want to speak about, I want to direct to the council. We just spent a bunch of time talking about buffer zones. The minimum buffer zone should be around 5,000 feet, not hundreds to a thousand of feet. The reason for that is if a criminal enters one of these locations, a piece of lead can fly a lot further than that thousand feet into a school or a library or anywhere else. We need to be realistic about our bus buffer zones and what they are and what they truly mean and what they're truly there for. It's not just the criminal activity, it's the exposure to our young minds to this garbage that has been shoved upon us once again. The rest of what I would like to say, we seem to have a lot of people who think it's okay to take my rights to quality of life away from me so they can grow the stinky weed and pollute my life in my neighborhood and possibly bring crime into my neighborhood that I have to defend myself and my family against. So this be wise and thoughtful to all your decisions and make them looking at the quality of everybody's life around this problem. I would vote for no growing in the city limits for any reason. There's plenty of places in the county to grow. There's plenty of places in the county it will and it is coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennard. Um, Josette Broseiker, 1110 Loma Court. Um, from personal experience, I know that dispensaries are nondescript and low key and want to be that way. It seems there's a prevailing element of reefer madness concerning having a storefront cannabis dispensary. I keep hearing that if children or teenagers know there is a dispensary, they will desire to get their hands on cannabis. I don't see this as a logical argument for not allowing a dispensary. After all, children and teenagers wander the, lic the liquor aisles of supermarkets and see adults filling their carts with bottles of liquor every day. But I also don't think that this thinking by many people is going to change. The things I hear most are parking, traffic, don't want it near residential, don't want it near kids. We all know lots and lots of people want a dispensary and we know lots and lots of people don't want it in certain places. So here's an idea. Why not start by figuring out where it would be or could be allowed in the city of Sonoma first and then proceeding from there. Right now there's a proposal for what sounds good on Arnold Drive Madrone spot. But the problem is the people living around it do not want it there for all the reasons I just stated. So I think the county should also do the same so that someone applying to open a dispensary knows, um, knows where it's, what zone it's acceptable in. With this approach, hopefully we could end up with one in the city limits and another in the unincorporated valley. Thanks so much. Gil Latimer, Grant Court, Sonoma. Good evening once again to City Council and staff. The Sonoma Valley Cannabis Group has submitted its petition for a medicinal dispensary with delivery service to the council electronically. We have also provided you with hard copies this evening. The petition includes well over 200 signatures from residents of the greater Sonoma area, all of whom stand to benefit from safe local access to medicinal cannabis. We have also included comments submitted by nearly 50 of those petition signers. The City Council has also received well over 40 emails from Sonoma area citizens who support a local dispensary. And there have been several discussion threads on Nextdoor Sonoma that have addressed the dispensary issue. And again, the vast majority support safe local access. We feel testing labs or manufacturing facilities are also a great idea as they too could provide the city with revenue. 
but to allow those and not permit a local dispensary would be hypocritical. Here, we would, have, we would be facilitating certain aspects of the industry to provide qual excuse me, quality controlled products for medicinal patients, yet on the other hand, deny local patients safe and legal access to a local dispensary. The two applications for dispensary south and north of town failed to be recommend, recommended by the Sonoma Valley Citizens Advisory Commission. There is still no local option for patients on the horizon. Sonoma's residents in need have gone too long without reasonable access. A dispensary that is local to a community affords a safe, affordable, and much more convenient alternative. We should also consider that the suffering that patients endure also extends to their families who want to see that suffering alleviated. Let's have a heart. Let's put the physical and emotional welfare of those most in need above misdirected concerns and old stigmas. Consider this. A city is not a machine, but a living body. It doesn't need mechanics to keep an eye on operation. It needs sustenance to grow and progress. City governments owe it to their citizens to do everything they can to empower them, and so therefore, we recommend that the City Council move forward on option C or D in order to provide safe, local access to the services Sonoma's residents deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Latimer. Uh, David Iker, 1110 Loma Court. I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around the fact that I'm actually here talking about allowing medical sales. Um, you know, for years, you've been you know, beat over the head with uh, um, that drugs are bad, drugs are bad. You remember the old commercial, you know, like, so had an egg, that this is your brain, and cracked it in the frying pan and fried it up, this is your brain on drugs. So, you know, for years I equated you know, all the dr illegal drugs, uh, marijuana, ecstasy, LSD, et cetera, on the same plane. And it, so over the years, I've got a bias against cannabis, and I know that. And it's also an emotional bias. But you know, you take a look at logically speaking, and I look at the logically, you know, it, it come up some different. Logically, I see it treated the same as liquor, you know, uh, you have the same restrictions, you know, 21, et cetera, and, and locations and so forth. However, I'm not going to be completely logical here because I do agree that um, we should have some restrictions on where it's placed. Um, first of all, I don't think not on the plaza because the rents for the merchants on the plaza already have too much pressure to allow the medical dispensaries in there. Uh, you might be even worse. Um, and so uh, also I think we should just try the medical marijuana now and I don't want retail sales uh, uh, within the city or, or, or nearby. Um, so you know, one of the things was mentioned and I probably will get mentioned here again is enforcement. And as long as the ordinance restrictions are clear and quantitative, then you can have enforcement because if you still say it's restricted, it's zero, you know, you have absolutely nothing, zero, you still have a problem with enforcement. If someone has one or two, then, you know, that, that's still a problem with enforcement. Um, and so whatever you decide, it, it should be very clear. Um, and in terms of, you know, crimes and bullets flying, so if we are worried about bullets flying and some, something being robbed, we need a buffer zone around liquor stores and banks as well because a lot of, you know, when we hear the news, they're often are, are, are uh, robbed. And so uh, I, if it doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, and as far as, you know, the children, you know, knowing about it, it's like you can see the liquor in the liquor store. They won't be able to even go inside like they can now in liquor stores. So. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eicher. Any other comments from the public? 
Yes, um, Jewel Matheson, 1396 Lubeck, um, also with Sonoma Patient Group um, in Santa Rosa. Um, to answer to the questions that came up, um, it's my understanding that the collectives will be phased out in January um, 2019. And to answer the question about the um, manufacturing per lot of a pound, it's of three uh, grams, and then there's some um, that you accumulate to do the test, and there's a procedure in which you have to follow that it has to come from different parts. All, like what I said, random. It has to come yes, from different places. Yes, it needs to, and it, you have to, you know, you have to make sure it's sterile. There are all these rules about how you collect that sample. Um, and I just want to say that we have been a medical cannabis dispensary for over a decade. Um, I also was concerned because I am a mother. I didn't want the medical um, need to be um, undermined by um, the adult use. I was afraid we were going to be overrun by a bunch of kids, and my purpose of d giving medicine to qualified patients would be diminished. What I found in, in all states that have ratified the medical marijuana and then have gone on to sell cannabis, they're finding that actually seniors is the largest population that are coming to us. Those that were too afraid to seek cannabis because they didn't they didn't want their name on any registry with the state. They were afraid to ask their doctor, but now. Now that it's legal, they're feeling that a little bit more comfortable to come in and answer questions. So I'm not seeing us overrun by a bunch of kids or people that I think I'm whether question whether they re really need this as medicine. I'm finding that a lot of seniors are coming to us. Um, and again, as we've made that transition into recreational sales or adult sales, I would now suggest that you opt for option D, so you can control, the city can, can keep control of the medicinal, of both medicinal use and recreational or adult sales. If you opt for just option C, and that ordinance or the um, petition moves forward, and you may lose the option to control the adult sales. Um, so I, um, I think you might just go for C, but um, would encourage you to maybe look at option D. And that's all, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any others? Ken Brown, still living at 1396 Lubeck Street, I hope. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm not very often at a loss for words, but uh, these deliberations are testing my ability. I personally went through a horrific experience when my wife got cancer. She had a breast amputated. Fortunately, <clears throat> we had a doctor at the time who recommended cannabis, and it saved our marriage, it saved her life, and it provided a much needed response to her illness. We've lost Dear friends, gone, because th there was no cannabis dispensary in Sonoma. They had to drive or have somebody <clears throat> drive for them to Santa Rosa. It's brutal. There's a heart that beats in Sonoma, and it doesn't beat for no cannabis sales. We sell alcohol. I mean, it's already been proven that alcohol destroys lives, destroys marriages, destroys kids. But that's okay. That's okay in Sonoma. Drink up. Party on. It, it, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't grasp it. Cannabis is far safer than alcohol. I go to Bank of Marin, my bank, take your hat off, don't wear your hoodie. You know, the door's locked, they have to buzz me in. Are we gonna have guards and restrictions on banks and liquor stores? Let's get real here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Do we have any other comments? 
See, seeing no one rise to the podium, I would like to close the public comment session. A couple of questions for anybody who wants to, to answer. Um, so with the testing labs, do, does anyone know the chemicals that they use? How are they disposed of? What happens to the environment with the testing labs? I know we're off subject, but these are just, I need to satisfy myself here. Yeah, yeah, the testing labs that wouldn't necessarily be using uh, any bulk chemicals or anything else for the testing. They're basically verifying the, con the uh, components of the cannabis. So they're using uh, various different equipment types to extract the various different components of the cannabis product. So me to measure those, so there sorry. would not be uh, any kind of okay. chemical disposals. And some those. may have pesticides, that some of the cannabis, is that right or no? So that's, how is that? Well, that's what they would be testing for, and based on the small sample they would be taking, they, they would be any. they're all required to dispose of any of their products or any of their waste in an environmental and safe way as part of the state regulations. Okay, thank you. I have one more question. You know, he, well, um, one of the issues, of course, with respect to uh, marijuana was, and I don't care what any police say, I, I don't believe it, there's no way to measure it. Um, measure marijuana in your system, although I've seen somebody was charged with, when he killed, I don't know what happened, alcohol and marijuana. I think they have to drop the marijuana case. I, I don't think they have blood levels. I don't think they really have perfected testing that. So I don't know if you gentlemen know anything about that. There currently is not a, a, a feel like a field sobriety test like a uh, for cannabis, although that is being worked on throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And um, looking at you'd have to talk to the police as far as the actual how they, because currently they do uh, use field sobriety tests to measure impairment in driving, but that can be cannabis, prescription drugs, or other types of right. activities also. Well, I you know because it's going it's such a big industry now and moving fast, I'm sure something will come up, you know, and um, so I'm happy, happy about that. Um, what are the other things? I guess those are my two questions. Thank you. I have a question about the process at this point. I assume the, for comments we're going to be like going in some sort of methodical order or it seems to me, I mean, all of this, we've had a lot of presentations, a lot of this has been uh, similar information, but the threshold question of whether there's any overlap on any of these things, like, I feel like that should have been answered at the very beginning, and because it could, the whole thing could be moot, maybe only have two people supporting anything, or if we know where we overline and we can, you know, start breaking down these things, because I think, you know, even deciding you know, where it should be, what the buffer should be, those are very uh, kind of complicated questions. So how, how are we gonna start? Well, so I was oh, oh. I was just gonna say that going into this process, there were several council members who simply wanted more information, and that was an object of this process. And so that's something that we've attempted to provide over the last couple of months. Uh, now that that information has been developed, uh, yes, we're definitely looking for the, those areas of overlap, and I suppose that um, one way to begin would just be at a very high level in terms of these different options, A, B, C, or D, and depending on where those areas of overlap are among the, the broader options, we can then hone in on some of the specific uh, questions that apply to, uh, to them or, or not. Okay. David? Well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, I'm only for option A, which we've already had with the municipal delivery allowed from outside dispensaries. Um, I oppose to have a dispensary in the city of Sonoma to the state. Like I said earlier, it's a moving target. Um, one of my main objectives to letting uh, or allowing the growing of outside of half of what the state mandate is, is six is to make sure that people have access to it and having the, the delivery. Um, 
I do want to have a little bit more discovery uh, based on Mayor Agramonte's comment about taxation of the delivery coming in to the city of Sonoma. Um, I would probably oppose it just because I don't want it to get the price too high for people that, that need the medicine. Um, but I would like to know a little bit more about that because the jurisdiction that it is coming from, I, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more of that. But at this time, I would oppose uh, dispensary in the city of Sonoma. Um, well, I'm not going to get into the, all the nuances, but I support option C. I also support option D. I think it is a relevant point. I guess we could revisit it, but if the ballot measure that we discussed earlier were to pass, that would allow for adult use. I would prefer for us to be the ones regulating that instead of have it to be regulated by ballot measure. Um, uh, and we've talked about this so many times, so I'm not going to reiterate my reasons for supporting it. But I think C and D with a limited number, one, two, two dispensaries are reasonable. So um, I'm going to go along with uh, option A because we've already done that um, as well. Um, I believe that when we, people talk about tax revenue, I, I, I just don't believe it. I think once Jeff Bezos starts delivering cannabis, it's, it's all going to be over for anybody who has a storefront. Um, and I don't think it should be on the plaza. I, I mean, I just I don't think that should be what we're known for. And it's okay if Sonoma doesn't have a dispensary. There's probably going to be one on 8th Street. There's probably going to be one on at Four Corners. I'm sure there's going to be one in the Springs and um, or in one of those locations. So the proximity is going to be there. But I think the really smart operators are going to make sure people get this. Back when this first came up in Planning Commission 12 years ago or so, I think that was the number, maybe 10 years ago, we talked about how wonderful it would be if we had medical a medical dispensary at the hospital because the hospital is always reaching out to us for more money and and uh, more tax uh, revenue this would have been a perfect thing for that situation um, and, uh, and appropriate as far as I'm concerned um, so you know as far as the me medicinal delivery I believe at some point it's going to be like getting a pizza um, you're just gonna be able to order it and it's going to show up at your house um, so I agree with uh, Councilmember Cook um, and that's the direction I'll be going on this as well. Uh, well, and consistent with uh, where I was the last time we had this meeting, I would support option C. I would also support option D. Um, it's f and generally as a threshold, I would start with one, although I do think there'll be future opportunities. Uh, I think now they're calling them the dispensaries, but in the sort of medical spa side of things that I think could happen maybe in the future, and that would fit really well uh, in Sonoma. And uh, for anyone that, I think people, when they like imagine what these things are like and what it is like in real life, they're, they're diabolically different because I've, the, the city that I have been looking to a lot about this is the city of Katadi, who is smaller than Sonoma. They have one dispensary, and I've been I've talked to their city council members many times. I've seen it myself, uh, and they've had a really positive relationship with this business because they did an RFP process. They came together, and it's a very symbiotic relationship. Like you know, the store as soon as you go in, they have a little list of rules, and they thank the city on there and say you know by by doing these things, you can help us stay and. You know, the city officials uh, have nothing but positive things to say about them. So, you know, the thing, Sonoma, we probably would only have one, so I think we have a lot of control over to what it looks like. We get to pick who it is, and we get to have this relationship with them. Uh, and I think it could be a really positive experience, and even figuring out, you know, where to tuck it, you know, and certainly not on the plaza, Broadway, but there's a lot of places here. We have a lot of shopping centers. I mean, Whole Foods would be the best place. But I think that... Uh, just based on uh, my conversations with Katadi and how still uh, how happy they are with their decision of picking this company and where it is, uh, I think that Sonoma similarly could go down a path, find a great business uh, that really wants to work together and be a good steward of our city and make it a very good po positive experience for everybody. Just me. Well, you know, uh, I don't think it's a secret um, how I feel. And, of course, I prefer option A. 
And um, you know what? But somebody said to me, this is sort of a moving target. This could be something very different in eight or nine months from now. This could even look different in t a year. So I don't, you know, uh, there are a few things as I sh shared that uh, are issues for me, but um, this, you know, option A is where I would be comfortable at this point. And I, I agree with you, David, about the taxing, because of course you would like people to be able to afford you know, afford that, and I think uh, there was some uh, offer that there are off actually nonprofits that might even fund uh, medicinal marijuana for patients. I, I don't know about that. So I think you've heard what we've said. Um, looking to the consultants here in terms of taxation on dis on delivery, if maybe there's any additional information they can provide on that. Can you go to the slide that shows the California sales and use tax definition on the broader list of slides? Can we just see how many people are interested in talking about that? Maybe, maybe I can just talk through it. So, uh, Can we just see if people want, if the sure. majority wants to sure. discuss this? We can. I was just, it was a question that was raised, and so when I... Um, what we will be doing as we move forward is on as we leave dispensary and go to testing the manufacturing on this one um, I will want a straw vote um, and then if you want you can do the straw vote on the dispensary but then there is the question of whether we want to look at taxation or not because if that is something we want to explore then we would need to bring that back when we bring the final ordinances back with that so we can move forward and do the final straw vote on, we do the straw vote on this first. We can ask for um, a motion, and then we can um, come back to the question about uh, whether to do taxation. So are we ready for a motion? So we're gonna finish dispensary first we're and going then to talking about the other no. things. What we're gonna do, the, the so the first is, um, the, the first issue is to um, get direction on um, which of the op uh, based on the options and so do a straw vote on the dispensary and then we can have another conversation about whether we want it, the taxation and then really that would be it as I understand it for based on choosing option A. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that uh, we approve option A. Second. Um. Can I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Cook? Aye. Councilmember Hundley? No. Vice Mayor Harrington? Uh, no. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Mayor Agramonte? Yes. Motion carries three to two. Okay, so now I'll ask um, our consultants from Muni Services if they can provide some information about taxation of option A, which would be delivery from outside in to Sonoma. But isn't the threshold question, do we want to tax it? I think it is a question, but first just the general information of what could it look like um, if you wanted to do it. Um, I just, I'm, I want to be clear if it's similar to any of the rest of kind of the options that we've seen for regular dispensaries or if there's any different. I don't know the answer to that. That's really the th question I was asking. So, so and it may be I'm exactly if the same. we hear a whole presentation on taxation and we don't have a majority who want, who are even interested in taxation, we just, what is the point of that? Okay, the only point I guess I was asking for was just wanting to be clear, some clarity of is it different or similar to um, a regular dispensary. I just wasn't sure about that for, the, for myself and wanted to make sure that council knew if there was a difference. So this is the, so the only question I have to the consultants is, is there a difference in taxing outside delivery to um, a site-based dispensary? Yes, yes there is. So the Bradley Burns, local sales tax, that's the 1% of that seven and a quarter percent state uh, sales and use tax, is based on the primary business location. So in the case of a dispensary outside the city limits that would deliver into Sonoma, you would not be able to collect the Bradley Burns portion of the sales tax, your normal 1%. You do, however, 
have a district tax in Sonoma of one half of 1%. That would be able to be collected um, based on the destination of the product. The second question was, are there common tax structures for delivery services? Uh, some cities have uh, required permits or licenses to deliver into a jurisdiction. That can be based on, uh, you know, a, a percentage of uh, gross receipts from those deliveries. It could be based on a monthly or annual fee per delivery business or per vehicle. There are a number of different models. The one caution I would share with the council is that um, these are fairly difficult to collect and administer. So there's no prime, there's no like a delivery prime for this, okay. No, and I, I, I would just say that it, it, doing any type of a percentage, I just don't, it's not, yeah. it's gonna well, be way cumbersome. I think the know. only thing you, if council, um, again, folks need, would need to get a business license if they're gonna deliver, you could have a small fee, application fee or something, but I would not advocate that you do anything complicated um, uh, would be my advice on this. So, I'm sorry, did, 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 I've heard different things about delivery services. One place we were at, they said it was free. So delivery is free or there's a charge? I think it's up to the business to determine whether they have a delivery fee or whether the service is, quote, free and included with the price of the product. Thank you. So I think where we are, we said option A. So are you satisfied, David, with the taxation issue that we really don't need to take a look at it? Or? Yeah, we don't need to take a look at it. I just wanted more information because uh, you brought it up and I thought it was an interesting discussion, but no. We don't want cash. All right, so at this point, the um, unless I'm looking for a consensus on council on this, so um, we would, not be looking for any taxation on delivery. That would be, they, someone coming in would have to have show proof of a state license or deliver as our current ordinance reads and have a business license. Um, but that would be it. There would not be any other taxation or fees on top of that. Is that the consensus of council? Yes. Okay. All right, so moving to the next question, which was, I believe, either testing or manufacturing. So maybe if you could each, we can maybe handle these together and say what is what are folks' interests on manufacturing and testing? First, is there a level of support for having these types of commercial cannabises in town? Well, I'll start off. Um, I would not support uh, either. I support both, and um, I just want to say, um, you know, there has been discussion about creating industries here. People have talked about, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but like different food products that could happen here. And, you know, for my investigation into this, there are good jobs that are coming from the marijuana industry. Those are going to involve testing, which is laboratory work, and also manufacturing. Um, I don't think we have a lot of spaces here. Probably. Um, on 8th Street is a better location for it, but to the extent that we can foster um, good jobs here, I support that, um, and I support both of those. Harry? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Most testing in, in my industry is accredited labs, and most wineries have their own labs, but then they send the, the real detailed stuff to accredited labs, and I think there's quite a few of those in the um, startup phase, not just here in Sonoma County, but all over California. Um, and then some have better reputations than others. So I don't see that as a huge opportunity. Um, uh, I agree the possibility with food and that sort of thing, but that's, that ball's, you know, that's already flown over the fence, I think. Um, there's a lot of giant companies who are getting into this, and I don't know that there's gonna be an opportunity for little tiny companies to make that happen because the big boys are, are already moving into it. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, I think it just creates another opportunity for an issue or a problem. So I'm not going to support manufacturing and testing as well. I would uh, welcome manufacturing or testing, uh, recognizing that manufacturing could be something small, like a small uh, 
food related producer and testing you know right now the big lab is going to be in Santa Rosa and I do think that there could be a success here for something that was small and in this particular location and I think it's a great point about the higher paying jobs because this is something that is not hospitality related and they actually naturally has well paying jobs for its employees and I think that we need more of that. So it's interesting the one lab that I, I, I visited in Santa Rosa had the gentleman who great guy he said he actually worked for the wine industry and actually went into this testing so but at this point I am not willing to go with manufacturing or testing. All right. So can we have a straw vote on um, testing manufacturing? You can do them both together. I'll make a motion to oppose manufacturing and testing in the city of Sonoma. Second. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Cook? Aye. Councilmember Henley? No. Vice Mayor Harrington? No. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Mayor Agramonte? Yes. Motion carries three to two. Just a few minutes break, sure. thank you.
to open the meeting back up. This is the update on fiscal year 2017-18 budget and discussion consideration and possible action to adopt a resolution to amend fiscal year 2017-18 budget resolution number 36-2017 to accomplish fiscal year 2017-18 mid-year budget amendments. Uh, Mayor Agramonte and Council, so I'm going to hand off to Sue Casey, our Assistant City Manager who oversees finance here in just a second, um, but um, I do want to just articulate um, the this is our 17-18 um, budget. Usually we would be back and be doing a mid-year budget in typically February, early March, no later. But with all of the fire expenses and FEMA and working through all those through um, and the FEMA consultants were here through those conversations went through the end of April and then we also had um, a gas tax audit as well during the same time period um, so for that reason some of this is to you a little later because we didn't have some of the information um, but we do now and wanted to make sure that we brought this information so there's uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sue Casey to give you a little update about what 17 18 is looking like and then there are a variety of budget adjustments if um, council has any questions so Sue good evening always the best for last <laughs> um, so tonight, um, as we mentioned, we're presenting an update on the fiscal year 17-18 budget and also requesting possible action on budget amendments to the City of Sonoma's operating and capital budgets for fiscal year 17-18. Um, so um, as we're all very keenly aware, fiscal year 17-18 has been an extraordinary year for the City of Sonoma. Um, in October 2017, the County of Sonoma was hit hard by a devastating wildfire and fortunately the city of Son Sonoma itself suffered no damage, physical damage, um, but the surrounding Sonoma Valley, city of Santa Rosa and other portions of Sonoma, Sonoma County were just ravaged. And um, although we suffered no physical damage, uh, the financial aftermath of the fire um, did neg negatively affect some of the city's major revenue sources. And as Kathy mentioned, um, norm normally staff would present a mid-year budget review in February, but because some of the city's major revenue sources, property tax, sales tax, TOT, um, are um, received in arrears, we really couldn't make an accurate forecast until we received all of those. Um, so um, although sales taxes and TOT revenues, um, which are largely tourist dependent, um, are coming in lower than originally budgeted due to the fire impacts, sales tax is about $62,000 less than budgeted and TOT is about $251,000 less than budgeted. Property taxes and EMS ambulance billing revenues are projected to come in higher for the year. Um, property taxes are up about $156,000 over budget and EMS ambulance billing is up about 350,000 over budgeted amounts. So these combined with all of the projected revenue variances is resulting in an overall fiscal year 17 uh, projected revenue of increase of approximately $140,000. Um, so the effects of the fire are also resulting in a variety of increased expenses for the city. Um, over time for staff members who kept the city's water system up and running during the fire emergency. Uh, evacuation shelter expenses, expenses and then some contract assistance which included public information assistance, the North Bay Incident Management Team support in the city's EOC and a FEMA documentation specialist to assist the city with our FEMA claim which is ongoing. Um, so total expenses to date um, for the fire emergency response equal 129000 Sonoma County is reimbursing us uh, six uh, $1,911 for the um, uh, evacuation or the evacuation shelter expenses <clears throat> and then a FEMA claim um, has been submitted for $92,561 and that claim is under um, review right now and um, the claim can just take months and sometimes years to be paid. 
Fortunately, these increased expenses have been up offset by um, a reduction in the sheriff's contract as they absorbed all city p police personnel costs, including overtime during the time of the fire because their staff time was focused on supporting the Sonoma Valley. And the sheriff's department is projecting that th this will reduce the city's salary expenses for the police contract by approximately um, $345,000. These, along with various other expense reductions, combined with the total projected year-end revenue increase in, um, increase in revenues, indicates that the city um, should end fiscal year 17-18 with an approximate surplus of $548,000. So at the time the budget was adopted, uh, several appropriation amounts in the budget were just based on estimates, including salaries and benefits, CIP carryovers, and vehicle replacement funding needed for the upcoming year. And then additional expenses for overtime um, related to the fire emergency response and then recovery actions were not anticipated or included in the original budget. Additionally, several expenses um, were shown as reserve fund balance, but they need to be appropriated as the expenses occurred this year. Uh, these additional expenses require men amendments to the original fiscal year 17 approved budget. So the requested combined total of revenue and expense budget adjustments for the general fund, which is detailed in attachment A to the resolution, increases the fiscal year 17-18 <clears throat> general fund appropriations by $12,133. And then the requested combined total of revenue and expense budget adjustments for all other funds, which is detailed in attachment B, um, shows a total increase in appropriations by $434,000. <clears> but 250,000 of these appropriations is merely a transfer from the successor agency to the general fund. The revenue offsetting these funds is already included in the successor agency and is also shown as revenue in the general fund. The expense to transfer these funds um, from the successor agency to the general fund was not included in the original budget. Um, a couple other things, um, contracts with bargaining units were not settled until after the budget was adopted. So the fiscal impacts of those changes are also incorporated into the attached budget adjustment. And the fire department is asking for allocations from the IGT fund, which is the funding is in that fund can only be used for emergency medical expenses and investments. And their new request is to provide supplies and equipment for a new, a new ambulance that was purchased last year and then to provide some additional training. So the attached resolution is to approve the mid-year budget adjustments, including those detailed above. Um, so staff is recommending that the council discuss the update of the fiscal year 17-18 budget and adopt a resolution to amend the fiscal year 17-18 budget resolution number 36, 2017 to accomplish, fish, accomplish the fish, <laughs> fiscal year 17-18 mid-year budget adjustments. And I'll answer any questions that you might have. Are there any questions? None? Oh, uh, I had requested when I met with the city manager for the detail on item 17, and I am prepared to move forward, but I still want to receive the item, the detail, which is the um, breakdown for the $27,000. Um, it was emailed out, and they, with oh, all the emails oh, you all gotten in the last um, two days, so it was emailed out yesterday with a breakdown. Oh, um, sorry. So feel free to take a look if you have any follow-up questions. Okay, my apologies. Thank no, you. Not a problem. <laughs> oh, David, Gary. Oh. So um, no, now out to the public. Do I have any comments? I'll take it out to the public. Good evening, Council. Uh, Chris Petlock, Napa Road. Um, so. Uh, I kind of was looking over this today, and one thing that jumped out at me was, um, uh, number one, um, seems like we have a little bit of information on budget year to date, but, you know, where is the actuals for um, for the uh, city for the year? Uh, also, you know, where's next year's budget? We've got about 30 days until the fiscal year's end. Uh, just doesn't leave a lot of time for review. Um, so last year, I submitted a Public Record Act request for a lease agreement that's uh, referenced in a transfer from the water fund for about $35,500. Um, that was never provided, so uh, if that's available, I'd like to see that. 
Um, even if there is a lease agreement, it's not really an arm's length contract, so any sort of agreement with the city with itself would be a void contract. Um, this transfer is just a transfer workaround that's actually illegal. It's just a tax uh, on ratepayers. We didn't get to vote on it. Um, if you have to raise taxes, make the case to voters, put something on the ballot, we have a right to vote for taxes. Uh, transferring money out of the Water Enterprise Fund does not make any sense right now. Um, in your recent um, water, uh, uh, water study, there was uh, $10 million in neglected assets that have been identified. Um, that money can certainly be used to um, shore up the water system. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe just a few responses to Mr. Petlock. Um, so the transfers that there is um, one tramp, there are, uh, let me back up for a minute. There are a number, of, a few transfers from the water fund um, to the general fund. These transfers are reimbursements. So the way to think about this is that this, um, the city has um, assets that are used by the water fund, which is a separate kind of bank account, separate books, and a separate enterprise. And so um, the world of allow of how there are things that are provided by the general fund that then um, are reimbursed or paid for by the water fund. So as Mr. Pratlock knows and his council knows, we agreed that um, we would do this water rate study, which we are in the middle of, and that we would be looking at the transfers as part of um, looking at what we would continue moving forward in 1819. That review is underway and we'll be bringing council some information shortly. Um, in terms of the specific item that's on the mid-year budget request um, adjustment that was referred to, there um, have been two leases and um, one is called a transfer in lieu um, traditionally it's what it's been called on our transfers and one has been called a lease uh, and those are one is to the for the a water tank that sits within the city owned property but within the cemetery what we consider the cemetery property and the other is on another piece of property owned by the city um, and that is um, where there's also a tank the city also has some tanks where the, the city has used water fund property to buy the land and to put the tank on. But these are tanks that were, the tank was paid for by the water fund, but that land is owned by the city. So it is um, allowable under state law um, to have a lease rate, what's called a lease rate. There is no formal lease um, to Mr. Petlock and there does not need to be a formal lease. Uh, but what you're looking is what is the um, what is a what could be assessed as a fair and actual a value or a barometer of a value and when we talk through this more um, with mr. Colantano our attorney will be here and he can talk through this in more precise detail but it is not illegal um, it is a it is a tw it is an option for to make sure that the general fund is not subsidizing the water fund and I think that's really what we're trying to do as we do this analysis is strike the balance because we have taxpayers that pay the tax our general fund taxes for and maintain the general fund and the services of the general fund and then we have ratepayers that are paying for water rates and those also need to be fair and so as we do this analysis um, we will be looking at that and bringing options back to council but this specific adjustment is one of the two um, transfers for um, the tanks that have been done for um, at least since 2010 and one of them was inadvertently left off the 1718 budget based on both Sue and I being new uh, again so it's not something new for 1819 this is something that has been traditional um, and so that is the purpose and some of the background on that so with that I'll turn it back to council if there's any other questions or action are there any questions from the council what is the pleasure of this council? I make a motion to approve the mid-year budget uh, adjustment. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Read it. You go. I'd like to approve a resolution to mid-fiscal year 2017-18 budget resolution number 36-2017 to accomplish fiscal year 2017-18 mid-year budget amendments. Second. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Cook? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Mayor Agramonte? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All 
on to uh, where are my dedications? The dedications. I think we did dedicate in name of Mr. Maffioli, and I'm sorry, I forgot his Mark. Mark. That's what I thought. Okay, Mark. Um, are there any council members' reports or comments? Uh, my only report is about Sonoma Clean Power, and we are hiring a new general counsel. And um, there's been a long Steve Shoup has been the longstanding um, counsel there, and he's retiring, and we're getting a new woman probably. She hasn't been voted on yet, but we interviewed her today. None tonight. Thank you.